Annual Report of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, December 1825 By the Commissioner of Indian Affairs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Annual Report of the Superintendent of Indian Affairs, transmitted with the message of the President at the opening of the first session of the 19th Congress, 1825-26. to Washington, printed by Gales and Seton, 1825. Excerpt from Document No. 1 of the House of Representatives, Message from the President, etc., December 6, 1825, 19th Congress, First Session. Also printed with the same pagination in Document No. 2 of the Senate, Message from the President, etc., December 6, 1825. Same Congress in session and same imprint. Department of War, Office, Indian Affairs, November 30, 1825. Sir, I have had the honor to receive your directions of the third ultimo, as follows. You will, as early as practicable, report to me an estimate of the amount which will be required to be appropriated for the current expenses of the Indian Department for the year 1826. You will also report, separately, the amount of money dispersed and settled in the Indian Department, from the commencement of the present year to the termination of the third quarter of it, including disbursements for the same period under the appropriation for the civilization of the Indian tribes, the number of schools, where established, by what society, the number of teachers at each, and the number of pupils by last reports, together with the effects as already developed of the present system for civilizing the Indians, and its probable and ulterior consequences upon them as a race, viewed both in relation to their present situation and that which contemplates their future and permanent residence upon lands west of the Mississippi. You will report also the operations of commissioners appointed to hold Indian treaties under acts of the last session of Congress, and such other remarks as you may think proper to make in relation to the administration of the Indian Department. I had the honor, on the 14th ultimo, to furnish the estimate of the amount, $153,000, required to be appropriated for the current expenses of the year 1826. The accompanying statement, which I have the honor now to submit, marked A, shews the amount of money that has been drawn from the Treasury on account of the Indian Department for the first, second, and third quarters of the present year, how much of that amount has been settled, and how much remains to be accounted for. It appears from this statement that $781,827.14 has been drawn from the Treasury, that $535,000 $17.87 has been accounted for, and that there remains to be accounted for $246,809.27. It is proper to remark that the sum of $191,368.91, which appears from this statement to be unaccounted for, is the unapplied balance of the appropriation of the 3rd March, 1825, of $250,000 in reference to a treaty with the Creeks, and is, though drawn from the Treasury, subject, at the pleasure of the Department, to its orders. If this sum be deducted from the balance of $246,809.27, there will remain to be accounted for $55,440.36, all of which, it is believed, will be fully accounted for when several returns, which are daily expected, shall be received. Statement marked B shows the number of schools, where established, by what society, the number of teachers at each, and the number of pupils, according to the last reports. These returns show that 38 schools are in operation, and that they contain 1,159 children. On comparing this with the report of last year, it will be found that four new schools have been established, and that the increase in the number of children for this year is 243. Measures were duly taken to carry into effect the Acts of Congress of the 25th May, 1824. I go back to this because its provisions have but just been executed. And of the 3rd March, 1825, the former having for its object the formation of treaties beyond the Mississippi, the latter the establishment of peace and boundaries between the various tribes of the Upper Mississippi and the Lakes, also another Act of the 3rd March, 1825, 
authorizing the president to cause a road to be marked out from the western frontier of Missouri to the confines of New Mexico, and which act also makes provision for holding treaties with the intervening Indian tribes, for the purpose of obtaining their consent to the marking of said road, and to the unmolested use thereof to the citizens of the United States and of the Mexican Republic. Advices have been received of as late date as the 21st September last from General Atkinson and Major O'Fallon, the commissioners appointed to carry into effect the provisions of the Act of the 25th May 1824, at which period they were at Fort Atkinson on the Missouri, to which place they had returned two days previous to the date of their letter, after having penetrated the country as far as the 2,000 Mile Creek, and fully accomplished, so far, the objects of their commission. It only remained for them to treat with a few tribes, the Mahas, Ottawas, Missouri, and Pawnees, which they expected to accomplish in twelve days, when they were to descend to St. Louis and report in more detail. It is understood that General Atkinson is on his way to this city bringing with him the treaties, and that the entire object of the commission is accomplished. Returns have been received from General Clark and Governor Cass, the commissioners appointed to mediate at Prairie du Chien between the Sioux, Sac, Fox, Iowa, Chippewa, Menomonii, and Winnebago tribes, and to establish boundaries between them. In this work of mercy, the commissioners have been successful. Treaties have been entered into with those tribes, by which their long and bloody wars have been terminated, and boundaries assigned to them, as the surest guarantee against future hostilities. Mr. Reeves, Sibley, and Mather, the commissioners appointed to mark the road from the western frontier of Missouri to the confines of New Mexico, and to hold treaties with the intervening Indian tribes, are engaged in the performance of those duties. With the view of adjusting certain claims of the Shawnees Indians for lands, in exchange for a tract hitherto occupied by them at Cape Girardeau in Missouri, and for spoilations of various kinds and improvements left by them at Cape Girardeau, General Clark was directed in March last to adjust these claims, and authorized, should it be necessary, to treat with the Osage and Kansas tribes for the extinguishment of their titles to lands for those Indians. This arrangement has been accordingly made, and in accomplishing it, and following up the views of the executive, in providing a country for such tribes of Indians as may think proper to emigrate and join their friends in the West, but especially to secure a country for the Creeks, in pursuance of the obligations of the general government, in its compact with Georgia, the commissioner very judiciously embraced, in the negotiation for the accommodation of the Shawnees, at that meeting, an extinguishment of the Indian titles to three or four millions of acres of land in Missouri and Arkansas, and nearly one hundred millions of acres beyond the western boundaries of Missouri and Arkansas. Reservations are secured to the Osages and Kansas, to the first a tract of fifty miles front parallel to, and about twenty-five miles west of, the western boundary of Missouri and to the Kansas, a tract of 30 miles front, parallel also to the western boundary of Missouri, and about 50 miles west of it, both running back to the Spanish line. A judicious arrangement as to space between those two reservations and between the frontier of Missouri has been effected. Thus, all the titles of Indians to lands within the limits of Missouri, except a few reservations, have been extinguished, and a country represented to be fertile and in all respects desirable, provided, and in sufficient extent, beyond the boundaries of Missouri and Arkansas, for the accommodation of all the tribes within the states which, should they incline to occupy it, it is the policy of the government to guarantee to them lasting and undisturbed possession. At the same time, treaties of peace and friendship were entered into between the Osage and Delaware, the Shawnees, Weas, Piankishaw, and Peoria tribes of Indians, and subsequently a treaty has been concluded, which assigns to the Shawnees fifty miles square of lands in the southwest corner of Missouri, with the privilege of exchanging them for a like quantity of land on the Kansas River, which, it is believed, they will prefer, for lands of theirs hitherto occupied by them at Cape Girardeau. The same treaty provides for payment for improvements abandoned by them at Cape Girardeau and for spoilations committed on their property there. From the representations of a deputation of Cherokees of the Arkansas and the Shawnees, who accompanied them in February last, it was believed that if they could hold a council with their friends in Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, they could induce them to emigrate and join them on their possessions in the West. This was the great object of their visit, 
Directions were issued to Governor Cass to meet them at Wapagoneto in Ohio, but nothing was accomplished except that deputations of some of the tribes intend, in the following spring, to visit their brothers of the West. It is probable that the object of that meeting may, in the course of the next year, be, in part at least, realized. The Quapaws, it is expected, will commence their removal from Arkansas to the country south of Red River on the 1st of January next, in conformity to the provisions of the treaty with them of the 15th November, 1824, and measures have been taken to fulfill the provisions of that entered into with the Choctaws on the 20th January, 1825. Nothing suggests itself to me in the way of improvement in the administration of the Indian Department as it is at present constituted, but under the modification which I have had the honor to suggest to you in my letter of the 15th instant, benefits of a valuable description might be anticipated. I will do myself the honor, in obedience to your instructions, to make the remaining parts of your directions of 3rd October the subject of a future and special communication. I have the honor to be, very respectfully, your obedient servant, Thomas L. McKenney. Honorable James Barber, Secretary of War. End of Annual Report of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, December 1825, by the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. Read by Step Heather in Bangalore, India, January 28, 2023. An act to restrain all persons from marriage until their former wives and former husbands be dead. 1604 by King James I of England and Wales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Forasmuch as divers evil-disposed persons being married run out of one county into another, or into places where they are not known, and there become to be married, having another husband or wife living, to the great dishonour of God, and utter undoing of divers honest men's children and others. 2. Be it therefore enacted by the King's Majesty, with the consent of the Lord's spiritual and temporal, and of the commons, in this present Parliament assembled, that if any person or persons within His Majesty's dominions of England and Wales, being married, or which hereafter shall marry, do at any time after the end of the session of this present Parliament, marry any person or persons, the former husband or wife being alive, that then every such offence shall be felony, and the person and persons so offending shall suffer death as in cases of felony. 3. And the party and parties so offending shall receive such and the like proceeding, trial, and execution in such county where such person or persons shall be apprehended, as if the offence had been committed in such county where such person or persons shall be taken or apprehended. Part 2 provided always that this act, nor any thing therein contained, shall extend to any person or persons whose husband or wife shall be continually remaining beyond the seas by the space of seven years together, or whose husband or wife shall absent him or herself, the one from the other, by the space of seven years together, in any parts within His Majesty's dominions, the one of them not knowing the other to be living within that time. Part 3 provided also, and be it enacted by the authority aforesaid, that this act, nor any thing herein contained, shall extend to any person or persons that are or shall be, at the time of such marriage, divorced by any sentence had, or hereafter to be had, in the ecclesiastical court, to, or to any person or persons where the former marriage hath been or hereafter shall be, by sentence in the ecclesiastical court, declared to be void and of no effect, nor to any person or persons, for or by reason of any former marriage had or made, or hereafter to be had or made, within age of consent. Part 4. Provided also that no attainder for this offence made felony by this act shall make or work any corruption of blood, loss of dower, or disinherison of heir or heirs. 
End of an act to restrain all persons from marriage until their former wives and former husbands be dead, 1604, by King James I of England and Wales. Read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2023. A Book Lover and His Books by Harry Lyman Koopman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The naturalist Lloyd Morgan, in one of his lectures, threw together on the screen pictures of a hummingbird and an insect of the same size, the two looking so much alike as to seem to the casual observer to belong to the same order. Yet, they are anatomically far more different than the man and the fish. In much the same way, we may be led to suppose that a Chinese book and an Occidental paper-bound book are much the same thing in origin as they are to the eye. But here, too, the likeness is only apparent. One book form has descended from a block of wood, and the other from a fold of silk. The Chinese book is such a triumph of simplicity cheapness, lightness, and durability that it deserves a more careful study at the hands of our book producers than it has yet received. In fact, we do not see why books made on nearly these lines should not be an attractive and popular innovation in our book trade. Approaches, to be sure, have been made to this peculiar book form. They have been partial imitations, not consistent reproductions. In an illustrated edition of Longfellow's Michelangelo, published in 1885, Houghton, Mifflin, and Company produced a small folio, the binding of which is obviously patterned after that of a Chinese book. But the printing is on every page, and the paper is so stiff that the book will not lie open. In the holiday edition, which the same publishers issued in 1896, Waldrick's poem entitled Friar Jerome's Beautiful Book they produced a volume in which the front folds were not intended to be cut open, but they outdid the Chinese by printing on only one of the pages exposed at each opening of the book, instead of on both, as the Chinese do, thus utilizing only one-fourth of the possible printing surface of the volume. In this case again, the paper was stiff and the binding was full leather with heavy tapes for tying. A much closer approach to the Chinese book form was afforded by the periodical, issued by Henry Froude, in the form which it bore at first. Here we have what may fairly be called a naturalization of the Chinese book idea in the Occident. But let us see exactly what that Chinese book form is. A standard book is printed from engraved wood blocks, each of which is engraved on the side of the board, not on the end like our wood blocks, and for economy is engraved on both its sides. Each of these surfaces prints one sheet of paper, making two pages. The page, being unisized, is printed only on one side, and the fold is not at the back, as in our books, but at the front. The running headline, as we should call it, with the page number, is printed in a central column, which is folded through when the book is bound, coming half on one page and half on the other. There is always printed in this column a fan-shaped device called the fish's tail whose notch indicates where the fold is to come. It may be remarked in passing that the Chinese book begins on what to us is the last page, and that the lines read from top to bottom and follow one another from right to left. Each page has a double ruled line at top and bottom and on the inner edge. The top and bottom lines and the fish's tail, being printed across the front fold, show as black lines banding the front edge when the book is bound. The bottom line is taken by the binder as his guide in arranging the sheets, this line always appearing true at the front edge and the others blurred. The top margin has more than twice the breadth of the lower. After the sheets are gathered, holes are punched to proper distances from the back edge. Four seems to be the regulation number, whether the book be large or small, but large books have an extra hole on top and bottom towards the corner from the last hole. These holes are then plugged with rolls of paper to keep the sheets in position, and the top, bottom, and back pages are shaved with a sharp, heavy knife, 50 or more volumes being trimmed at the same stroke. A piece of silk, 
is pasted over the upper and lower corners of the back. Covers consisting of two sheets of colored paper folded in front like the pages are placed at front and back, but not covering the back edge. Or there is an outer sheet of colored paper with inside lining paper and a leaf of heavy paper between for stiffening. Silk cord is sewn through the holes and neatly tied. And the book is done, light in the hand and lying open well, inexpensive and capable, with proper treatment lasting for centuries. What are the chief defects of the Chinese book from an Occidental point of view? The most obvious is that it will not stand alone. Another is that its covers, being soft, are easily crumpled and dog-eared. A third is that it is printed only on one side of the paper and therefore wastes space. All of these objections must be admitted, but it may be urged with truth that our books, in spite of their relatively costly binding, do not stand alone any too well. And in fact, this is a function seldom asked of books anyway. Its covers are soft, but this means, at least, that they are not so hard and foreign to the material of the book as to tear themselves off after a dozen readings, as is the case with so many of our bindings. There is no danger of breaking the back of a Chinese book on first opening, for it has no lining of hard glue. As to the utilization of only one side of the paper, it must be remembered that the Chinese paper is very thin, that this practice makes it possible to secure the advantage of opacity without loading the paper with a foreign and heavy material. Moreover, the thickness of the pasteboard cover is saved on the shelves, and even if a substitute for it is adopted, it is in the form of a light pasteboard case that holds several volumes at once. Such a cover is capable of being lettered on the back, though the Chinese seem not to think this necessary, but put their title labels on the side. Really, the back of the Chinese book is to us its most foreign feature. It is a raw edge, not protected by the cover, and differs from the front only in consisting of the edges of single leaves instead of folds. It is, in fact, a survival from the days before the invention of paper, when books were printed on silk, the raw edge of which would fray and was therefore consigned to the position where it would have the least wear and would do the least harm if worn. But there is no reason why, in Europeanizing the Chinese book, the corner guard should not be extended the whole length of the back and bear the ordinary lettering. With this slight difference, the Chinese book would be equipped to enter the lists on fairly even terms against the prevailing Occidental type of book, which has come down to us from the ancient Roman codex through the parchment book, of which ours is only a paper imitation. In the periodical referred to, Four pages instead of two were printed at once. At least four constitute a fold. The sheets are stitched through with thread. They might, of course, have been wire stitched. And then a paper cover is pasted on, as in the case of any magazine or paper-bound book. But in this process, the beauty of the Chinese binding disappears, though the Chinese do the same with their cheapest pamphlets. In these days, when lightness and easy handling are such popular features in books, what publisher will take up the book form that for 2,000 years has enshrined the wisdom of the Flowery Kingdom, and by trifling adaptations here and there, make it his own and ours? End of the Chinese book from The Book Lover and His Books by Harry Lyman Koopman. Read by Alan Kelly. The Cradle of the Movies, from Picture Play Magazine, May 1917, by Charles Gatchell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Back in the days of beaver hats and hoop skirts, a member of the Cunard family, founders of the great line of steamships, built a stately family mansion at No. 11 East 14th Street, New York City. It was a square, four-story structure of gray stone, flanked with broad lawns. Great, winding stairways led from the upper floors to the main hallway, which opened onto an octagonal ballroom about 50 feet in width and depth, the scene of many a brilliant social gathering in the 50s. If the dignified owner of the old mansion had chanced to linger in the ballroom one night after the last slippered guest had left, to be rolled away in the last family chaise, 
and a spirit had appeared as distinctly as the ghost of Hamlet's father to tell him what would happen in that room fifty years later, would he have believed it? He would not. Neither would you, nor I, nor anyone else, had such a thing happened to us fifty years ago. For we would have heard something like this. Here, in this ballroom, will be cradled the greatest form of amusement the world will know in the coming century, the motion picture drama. Within these walls, men and women, working together, will develop this art from a cheap, tawdry beginning to a form that will bring every drama and story in the world's history down to every village in Hamlet, touching the lives of nearly everyone in the civilized world. And through these doors will come and go a group of actors, playing their parts in this magic transformation, each of whom will star in some one of a score of companies, their aggregate salaries amounting to far in excess of a million dollars a year. Would we have believed it? Hardly. By the time we'd collected our senses and finished mopping our brow, we probably would have summoned the butler and in husky tones suggested that at the next reception the formula for the punch be modified. Dropping the curtain for a moment, after this bit of prologue, let's raise it fifty years later. Outside, the old building looks much the same, save that now it is flanked by other buildings. But it is no longer a dwelling. The family living rooms for years have been artist studios. The ballroom has become the workshop of the Biograph Company. For twelve years they have been making one form or another of motion pictures there. By this time, 1908, they were turning out trick pictures and thrillers of the great train robbery type, competing with about nine other companies in supplying the Bijou and Nickelodeon theaters that had become scattered broadcasts throughout the country. The making of films was a hit-or-miss business, cheaply conducted, compared to modern standards. Actors were paid five dollars a day. One would serve about as well as another. Stars were unknown. The business was scorned by the people of the legitimate stage. The time for the magic transformation was at hand when David W. Griffith entered the old ballroom studio that year, looking for work. A play he had written for James K. Hackett had proved a failure. He had heard that the Biograph Company bought plots for motion pictures. At the studio, he was told they did, at from $15 to $25 each. What was more important to him that day was that he and his wife were given jobs acting. What Griffith saw when he entered the studio was one of the most crowded places in New York City. In every spare corner, carpenters and scene painters were at work. There was room for only one set at a time, and to get the camera far enough away, it had to be shoved back into the hallway. Griffith became a regular actor and scenario writer for the company, and before long was asking for a chance to direct a production. The chance was finally granted, and the result was The Adventures of Dolly. The film showed some new ideas, and the management was pleased, particularly when they learned that 28 prints had been sold, nearly twice the usual number. The magic had begun. Griffith waved his wand, and the stars began to appear. They weren't stars then, bless you, no. But the wand of Griffith's determination to get the kind of people who could convincingly portray the characters was so sure that, once he had picked an actor or actress, he or she seemed to be destined to later stardom. His method ranged from a glance caught in passing on the street, to the most searching inquiry into the mind of the person he was considering for some part. The late Arthur Johnson, one of the most popular screen actors until his death, was picked up by Griffith while searching Broadway for a man of a certain type. Blanche Sweet, on the other hand, was put through a third degree of rapid-fire questions by Griffith until, confused, she decided she would never work for such a man. Then, to her surprise, he laughed, told her she registered bewilderment and anger excellently, and that he could use her at once. He was always on the alert to find actors. There was a little girl who used to come and sit in the studio, watching her big sister, Marguerite Loveridge, act. Griffith chanced to notice one day how her face was reflecting the emotions of the actors. That very day he gave her a maid's part to test her ability. And so began the career of May Marsh, now a Goldwyn star. In his search for comedians, Griffith encountered Max Sennett, former chorus man at the Casino Theater. Then Sennett did a little magic of his own. He asked, as Griffith had before him, 
for a chance to direct the production. It was granted, and the Senate brand of knockabout slapstick comedy, made world famous later through the Keystone Company, was created. Picking actors was only part of Griffith's wizardry. His talent touched every side of motion picture production. He began to take pictures at close range to give full value to the actor's expressions. He demanded realism in his settings, as well as in the acting. Finally, he ventured to put on a straight drama, and a transformation was at last completed. The thing the public had been waiting for was ready. And that is how the old Biograph studio became the cradle of the modern movies. But those of us who were taking part in that transformation didn't realize what we were helping create in that little studio, nor the parts we were destined to play in its future development. Frank Powell, one of Griffith's early finds, now a producer, told me one day as he sat at his mahogany desk overlooking Times Square. Even Griffith himself didn't see the developments ahead. I recall asking him one day if it would be a good idea to begin getting picture rights for books and plays, but he dismissed the idea. No, we were just ordinary, hard-working actor folks, with plenty of hardships, scant accommodations, few complaints, and no temperament, not on five dollars a day. We had two dressing rooms, one for the men, the other for the women. Each room had four clothes hooks. Mary Pickford, who was just a little soldier like the rest of us, had a box brought into the dressing room one day. But it took up so much room that someone complained, and out it went. Can you imagine it? When I came to the Biograph, Griffith already had gathered the first group of future stars. His little company had been chosen to his liking, and was ready to tackle anything from farce to melodrama. For the women's parts he had Mary Pickford, Florence Lawrence, Marion Leonard, and Stephen Longfellow. The men included Arthur Johnson, James Kirkwood, Henry Walthall, Owen Moore, and for comedy Max Sennett and Billy Quirk. Fancy getting that crowd into a single cast today, and paying their salaries. But big salaries weren't dreamed of then. When I became a director and was raised to $40 a week, it looked tremendous. Sometime later, when Johnson left the company, he asked me what I thought he ought to ask for when applying to another company. I took a flight of imagination and said, $100 a week. He looked at me narrowly. One of us is drunk, he said, and it isn't me. We were both stunned the next day when he followed my advice and got the hundred. Until that time, Mary Pickford was the only one I can recall to receive so large a salary. We used to have to work day and night to turn out the two pictures required each week. Sunday was our day for going through scenarios and getting them ready to cast the next day. In order to make our first trip to California, we had to get eight weeks work ahead, and to do that we worked from nine in the morning until after midnight. At night, our meals were brought in from a nearby restaurant and eaten on a single table in the crowded basement, which was the prop room. I never shall forget, Powell said it slowly and with feeling, those cold steaks and the sugarless coffee. And that wasn't our only hardship. When we went to Fort Lee, on the Palisades, most of us caught the 810 ferry. Only a favored few ever traveled in motor cars. A great many out-of-door summer scenes had to be acted around New York in the winter. It was easily done when there was no snow on the ground, so long as leafless trees didn't show in the pictures. But it was chilly work in summer clothes. We made several such films in which all the men were kept smoking to disguise their breath, which showed in the frosty air. And the women, poor things, weren't allowed to open their lips. I often think of Griffith's kindness to the people who worked for him, and particularly to the extra people who were always on hand waiting for work. We had no room for them in the building, and they used to congregate in such numbers that the police often had to drive them away. You may remember that in the films of those days there were a great many crowds, largely made up of old people. I think Griffith often used them more out of sympathy than because the picture really demanded them. That same kindness and appreciation of talent that Griffith always showed to his regular actors did a lot toward their own development. I've only named the few who were there at the beginning. Of those who worked with him before he left the old studio, the list could be extended to more than half of the stars of today, I presume. Nearly all those early actors, by the way, became directors sooner or later. Johnson, Kirkwood, Max Sennett, 
George Nichols, Frank Brandon, and Dell Henderson, those at least. Powell paused, and as he did so I pictured to myself a scene which might have taken place at the time of which he was speaking. Up the steps and through the door comes the hurrying figure of Mary Pickford, all out of breath from walking, for there's no limousine to bring her, anxiously wondering if she's late to work. In the hallway stands another girl, Blanche Sweet, trying to get up courage to ask for Mr. Griffith to see if he will give her a job. Fred Mace has steered Owen Moore over in a corner to ask him if he'll stake him to a dollar until Saturday. Out of the director's office bursts an office boy, Bobby Heron, his face glowing with enthusiasm, making a streak for the dressing room. They need a messenger boy in a scene to be rehearsed right away, and Mr. Griffith has told him to jump into the uniform and see what he can do. Gee, if he can only make good. Griffith appears, holding a manuscript. Arthur Marvin is ready at the camera. The gong rings, and some way, out of all the bustle and confusion, the company gets together, the day's work begins, and there we let the curtain fall once more on the old ballroom. When it rises again, the scene and setting are in present time, and the wheels of the great industry that started revolving in the ballroom are turning in all parts of the world. Passing the old 14th Street studio one day, I stopped in for a moment for a glimpse of the old cradle of the movies as it appears today. It is still used for making pictures, though it is now rented out to smaller companies since the Biograph moved to their big modern plant near the end of the Bronx subway. A director was at work, leisurely rehearsing a comedian in a scene requiring only two actors. Everything was very quiet, very orderly. William Thomas Sr., veteran property master, who has been there since its earliest days as a studio, showed me through the rooms. It's the cradle of the movies, all right, he said, as we ended our short tour. And it certainly did some rocking. You can imagine how they kept me jumping, the way they kept getting new ideas every day. Just fancy, sir. We think we're handicapped now, putting on these little comedies. In those days, we had three directors working at once. While one was here, another would have a company out of doors somewhere, and a third ready to come on at night. The latter would often work straight through till morning, and the click-click of the camera kept away ghosts in the spooky hours of night. But we seemed to get along all right, though we didn't have near the system we have now. Say, ain't it funny? End of The Cradle of the Movies by Charles Gatchell Read by Andrea Kotzer An effective diplomatic service as an agency for the promotion of international peace by George F. Seward, ex-minister to China. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elsie Selwyn. It must be evident to the most careless observer that today in our land, as well as in other lands, sentiment adverse to war, and in particular to unnecessary war, is strong. The tendency is to make national growth depend upon progressive, peaceful development. Wars still occur, but for one which comes, many are averted by skillful statesmanship. Americans are eminently peace-loving, but Americans, like other people, are moved by impulses. A press always desirous of producing great effects finds in each annoying complication the occasion to promote that excitement which tends to war. Often other selfish interests are active. The most potent is the disposition to make political capital. We all remember how the regrettable incident of the Maine was made use of to inflame public sentiment. We all remember, on the other hand, the statement of Stuart Woodford that he could have worked out all desired results so far as Cuba was concerned, by the peaceful methods of diplomacy. I do not hesitate to declare that America ought never to have need of war. Our strength is great and our situation unique. Who is likely to attack us? Our purposes should be right. What may we not accomplish by the exercise of moral power skillfully exerted? It is this sentiment which must be inculcated in our land. Treaties of mediation and arbitration are good. They mark great steps in the world's progress. 
but they are well nigh useless if the disposition, let us have peace, is wanting. The creation, then, of a right sentiment for peace, the education of every man, woman, or child, to a right conception of the wickedness of unnecessary war, the enforcement of the idea that every controversy should be settled in the form of reason, this is a task to which all lovers of their kind should devote themselves. A diplomatic establishment can be a highly effective peace agency if it is rightly constituted. It is not a light thing to be the person selected to make public appearance for our nation at the capital of some other great nation, to mingle with its statesmen in representative capacity, to speak on great occasions, and to take part in great public functions. But the social and ceremonial duties of a diplomat are incidental only to his graver duties. There is no power resident in an international agent to demand, to threaten, or to use force. He is limited to such influence as his representative capacity and his personal qualities afford. Upon these, he must rely to win over the government to which he is credited to the wishes and purposes of his own government. To be merely the dependable source of information for the foreign office of one state is, again, not a light thing. It is difficult for most men to take just views of home questions. It is far away more difficult to judge of questions in a foreign state. It is not easy to get at facts when one is amid strange people. Facts, when ascertained, must be considered and presented with knowledge of local institutions, methods of administration, and national idiosyncrasies. The presentation must be absolutely without prejudice. The natural instinct of every man is to believe the morals and the methods, the manners, and the fashions of his country the best, and all morals, methods, manners, and fashions which are different, ridiculous, if not vicious. All this points to the proposition that a diplomatic agent must be capable of entering into the spirit of the people with whom he lives, of appreciating their institutions, and of judging them by their own standards. No man probably ever became the spokesman of any nation or of any interest who did not feel the task of moderating and managing his own side greater than that of managing the other side. No secretary of state is gifted with universal knowledge or universal sagacity. Neither is any president or cabinet. The nation's representative abroad is, so to speak, casting the line and taking soundings. If well informed, he is able to chart the course to be pursued. A foreign secretary without able representatives in foreign states is in a very helpless position. If regard be had only to issues of peace or war, it must be remembered that these have come to us of late with alarming frequency. In 13 years, we have had a great dispute with Chile over the abuse of sailors, with England over the Venezuelan boundary matter, and with Spain over Cuba. The two former were settled, the latter resulted in war. Diplomacy which would have averted these disputes would have been cheap at any imaginable cost. But outside of issues involving war or peace, it would be difficult to overestimate the duties of a diplomatic agent. In a thousand ways, he may be useful to his country and his countrymen. In whatever case his state or people touch the state, or people to which he is accredited, his services may be needed. He has a guardianship as respects the interests of his country. He prepares treaties, and he enforces the observance of them. He studies and reports upon administrative matters. He watches the course of scientific discoveries and points the way to the utilization of them at home. He is expected to be broadly useful, and the variety and extent of his work is such that he has the fullest opportunities for the exercise of the highest qualities and accomplishments. We all know that success in any line of individual effort does not necessarily indicate breadth of ability. The successful lawyer may be a special pleader, the successful preacher a bigot, the successful merchant may know little besides cotton goods or coffee, but the successful diplomat must be many-sided, accomplished, shrewd, free from prejudices, appreciative, and just. He must know what is serious, and that is a serious thing indeed. He must know how to fit means to ends. He must be a man of character, absolutely honest, and absolutely incapable of misleading his own government or that to which he is accredited. I am quite aware that many people estimate the quality of a diplomat differently. In their estimation, his proper function is often to make the wrong side appear the better, to speak speciously rather than sincerely. Will the man of character do these things ever? Will the man who does such things be acceptable to men of character in the state he represents, 
or in that to which he is accredited? It is only necessary to state the question to enforce the conclusion. If high character is needed anywhere, it is needed in diplomacy, if permanent success is to be achieved. In any right statement of the qualities of a diplomat, there must be included this proposition. He must be unselfish. There is a saying that peace hath her victories no less renowned than war. But a saying quite as true would be, peace hath her victories which are not renowned at all. The victories of a diplomatic agent are generally such. If he heralds them to the world, he destroys his usefulness. Perhaps the hardest of all tasks for an American politician turned diplomat is to hold his tongue about his achievements, real or fancied. Our government is based upon moral ideas. It is just these ideas which may be enforced in diplomacy. When the conclusions of a government may be enforced by arms, when the state is great because of its military resources, diplomacy is of less importance. Brute force instead of moral power is at the front. A late representative of our nation in one of the Asiatic states has said that before the victory of Dewey he sat helplessly in his seat, his hands hanging by his side. Was that man aware of the moral weight of his country? Had he learned the alphabet even of his profession? I mention the instance of our helpless representative not to throw a stone, but to illustrate a proposition. Our nation is as ignorant almost of the use which may be made of its diplomatic establishment as the given minister was of the possibilities of his position. I have quoted Mr. Woodford's claim that he could have settled the Cuban issue satisfactorily. Our nation was so little acquainted with the idea that great issues may be settled by diplomacy that it drifted into war. Do we, as a nation, appreciate the moral weight of our country? Americans touch government most closely in the administration of local municipalities. He would be a bold American who would declare that there is very much virtue or capacity exhibited in the control of our cities. We touch our diplomatic establishment the least of all departments. He may be a bold American who supposes we are reasonably successful in it. We cannot take our diplomatic establishment and so to speak, weigh it in a balance and compare weights with those of other nations. The success of an individual is due to qualities which are incapable of being measured. Even personal charms are of an intangible sort. The eye of the poet rolls in a fine frenzy, but an eye habitually rolling in frenzy does not make its owner a poet. It is an old saying that you may vote that a horse shall be a general, but that does not make him so. A concrete instance of the highest type of diplomat is Benjamin Franklin. Whether one considers his accomplishments, his common sense, his shrewdness, his constancy, his balance of judgment, his personal charm, his honesty, his acquaintance with affairs and human nature, his freedom from prejudices, no man was ever better qualified to win respect and to achieve success. If you will keep him in mind as an ideal foreign representative, you will be able to imagine how far the ordinary political appointee is liable to fall short of the highest standard. The success of our diplomatic establishment at large must be derived from the success of its individual members. If it is to stand high, if the weight is to be right, the units must be right. If we are to have a right weight of units, we must choose them on a right system. And there is no way in private business or in public to be reasonably sure of the merit of any choice of an agent which is not determined from observation of the fitness of the individual in the same line of duty. Until men have proven themselves right diplomats, there is no certainty that they will do diplomatic work well. Until we have a diplomatic service in which each individual may be tested, we shall have no way to choose our units with any certainty of being right. Having a right diplomatic establishment, our country would have assurance of the right handling of international controversies. With public sentiment devoted to the idea that such controversies should always be dealt with in the form of reason, not war, we should never be hurried away by passion. And given the acceptance of the plans for extreme cases provided in the Hague Convention, the occasions for war would become remote. Each factor is important, and we cannot afford to neglect any one of them. New York City. End of An Effective Diplomatic Service as an Agency for the Promotion of International Peace by George F. Seward. Read by Elsie Selwyn. The Fatal Legs by Walter Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The Fatal Legs by Walter Brown. I am an actor, or rather, I call myself one. I am, however, disengaged, the more so since Widow Walker has. But let me not anticipate, which, by the by, I never could have done. No matter. I took apartments, comfortably furnished, with a widow lady named Walker. I was first floor back, and first floor front was Mr. Simon Simpkin, of the theatre. The widow always called us first floors, either back or front, and never by our names, although we never called her out of hers. If we had, she would not have come. She was an obstinate woman, but at times she got confused. She always called me in the morning, and once she called me front, and then went to Simpkins with my shaving water. When I called her back, she called me something else and threw the pitcher at me. I was in hot water for a while. The widow Walker was fair, fat, and forty. That is, rather fair, extremely fat, and very forty. She might be more. At any rate, her voice was forte too. The actor Simpkins was fragile and long. He played heavy parts, which possibly was the cause of his constant complaint that he had never got his share of fat. Although lengthy, he was even less in his various diameters than I was. Still, I longed for his length. And why? The widow Walker wallowed in wealth untold, and I could see her smiling upon the suit of Simon Simpkin. Well, she might. It was second-hand. He, too, was a widower, or rather he would have been if his wife had lived. I mean, if she had lived to be his wife. But she didn't. She died before the fatal knot was tied. In fact, it was not tied at all. No matter. He had loved before, while my suit was brand new. I determined to try it on. I longed to win the widow for my wife. Should I say, for myself. One day I saw the actor kiss her through the keyhole. We were rivals from that moment, at least I was. He didn't see me, or he would have been one too. I mean, one also. That is to say, there would have been two of us, whereas there was only one of me. No matter. The widow went a good deal to the theatre. She ordered him and he gave her orders, that is, passes for two. He knew her size. She always took twos in seats. He did the villains at the theatre, while I did the hero at home. He bellowed in blank verse, while I blew the kitchen fire with the bellows. He mashed her, while I mashed the potatoes for supper but I determined to beard the clean-shaven lion in his lair. In short, or rather at length, I obtained an engagement, and became an actor. My rival and myself now stood on the same footing. I mean, we should have done, only in a word, we didn't. Simon Simpkin, as before observed, indeed observed anyhow, was slender as a willow wand, and appropriately pliable, especially around the legs. 
Still, on stage, his nether limbs looked round and well-proportioned. His calves may have passed for cows, and his knees were second elbows, or rather, elbas. They held a bony part in exile. On the other hand, I should say legs, my tights were always loose. And while the widow smiled on his understanding, she smiled at mine. I thirsted for my hated rival's blood, or rather for his flesh, more correctly speaking, for the shape of his legs, technically for his leg shapes. Having failed in an attempt to have his blood by means of a darning needle, I determined to go for his shapes. I went for them one night before the performance. I went to his dressing room and got them. That night the widow walker was in front. I was desperate. I was determined that she should see her Simpkin in all his naked, should I say his unpadded, deformity, and that mine, that is, my limbs, should be resplendent in his borrowed plumes. But alas, for all my plans, and myself, were violently overthrown by Simpkin. I had merely insinuated one leg in the woolly pads when he insinuated the other somewhere else. We argued the matter all over my dressing room. Meanwhile, time jogged merrily along. The curtain was raised, and so were we eventually. But, unfortunately, I had only retained one half of those precious pads. The right was on my left leg, and Simpkin had carried off the left leg all right. What was I to do? My left leg would not look right, or if it did, my right would be wrong. There was no time, however, for consideration, as my face required sponging before applying the sticky plaster, and eventually I had to hobble onto the stage with two odd understandings, that is, one odd one and one even one. Even that was odd, which appears odd, no matter. Fortunately, I went on from the O.P. side, which enabled me to put my best leg forward. In the center of the stage I met Simpkin, who had entered from the prompt side. The widow gazed with rapture on us both, until, oh, horror! After a short scene it was necessary for each of us should retire to the place from whence we came. We advanced toward it, backwards, mutually stumbling. Our other legs became exposed to view. A yell from the audience, a sack from the management, and a week's notice from the widow subsequently greeted us. Besides which, Simpkin and myself are not on the best of terms. We get into arguments when we meet in the streets. I stay home a good deal now. The End of The Fatal Legs by Walter Brown Preface and Introduction to Tales of the Sun or Folklore of Southern India by Georgiana Kingscutt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface In offering these few Indian tales to the public, I cannot refrain from adding a few words at the beginning to express to Pandit Natesha Sastri my gratitude for the great assistance he has given me in collecting them, assistance without which they would never have seen the light in the shape of a complete volume. When I began writing down these tales, my only means of collecting them was through my native servants, who used to get them from the old women in the bazaars, 
but the fables they brought me were as full of corruptions and foreign adaptations as the miscellaneous ingredients that find their way into a dish of their own curry and rice, and had it not been for Mr. Sostri's timely aid, my small work would have gone forth to the world laden with inaccuracies. Mr. Sostri not only corrected the errors of my own tales, but allowed me to add to them many that he had himself collected, and that had already been published, either in small volumes or in numbers of the Indian antiquary. For this reason, I have left several notes which Mr. Cooper Temple, Mr. Clouston, and others had added to the tales that had already been printed, as they were too valuable to dispense with, and may be of service to students of folklore. In conclusion, I would crave the indulgence of my readers with regard to the style in which the tales are written, which has been left as nearly as possible in the form of a literal translation, in order to lend the stories a couleur locale, which is characteristic of the country they spring from. G.K. Introduction It has often struck all lovers of folklore and national legends with wonder, that so many countries should have reproduced in different imagery and language the same tales. Persia, Arabia, and India give us the same fables as Italy, France, Norway, and Iceland, except for slight variations principally arising from difference of custom, distance of time, idiom, and nationality. Able writers have explained this to us by a theory worthy of consideration and admirable in its origin, but nevertheless wholly their own. They would have us believe that a certain group of tales belonged to a certain nation, and that through emigration and immigration, through wars and dispersions, these same tales have been carried backwards and forwards and dragged from country to country, borrowing the language and peculiarities of the lands they passed through, just as the seed of some rare plant is born on the breeze and bears fruit coarse or more refined according to the soil in which it at last takes root. In Germany, we have Gudeck, Kuller, Sichest, and a host of others who tell us that these tales are oriental, and that all fable originates in the East. Others again, that they are transmitted to us by the same channel as the Aryan languages from Aryan tradition. I cannot see why one nation or one country alone should have the intelligence of producing fables, which as a rule are next to religion in their teaching and intentions. If proverbs are the wisdom of nations, what are fables and legends but developed proverbs? What is the meaning of fable? It means an intent to convey moral instruction in a narrative in which the characters are represented by birds, beasts, or fishes, and often plants. Practically, a parable is the same thing, and folklore and fairy tales are the attempts of intelligent people to inculcate in their children or other ignorant people the great truths of religion or wisdom, by means of word pictures that would bring these truths within the easy grasp of undeveloped minds. It is the old repeated tale, the struggle between right and wrong, Faust and Marguerite, the wicked punished, the virtuous rewarded. Disguise them as you will, there are certain tendons which run through the world from age to age, cords which no human hand has yet severed, which no decree of God's has changed. These are love and death, hate and vengeance, virtue and vice, right and wrong, suffering and joy. And as long as there is a world, as long as children are born, Parents will invent fables with which to bring these facts before their offspring's eyes in an intelligible manner. In the fables of the East, and especially of India, there is one peculiarity, namely that craft and cunning are more generally rewarded than virtue and stupidity condemned. This is the national characteristic. The tales of southern India are as varied as any others, either Eastern or European. Magic and supernatural phenomena play a great part, but are usually assisted by the powers of the gods. This is, again, a national Hindu characteristic. The Hindu would shrink from any undertaking that is not under the patronage of the gods. Yet here is a very noticeable feature, namely, that the divinities are treated as entirely secondary in power, interwoven only into a man's daily affairs as a sort of backbone or support in time of need, but to be despised and trampled upon at other times with impunity. This is a natural feature in a nation which has a deity to represent every vice and sin, and lends a certain character to the tales of southern India different to the folklore of other countries. Probably further research will lay bare many still hidden treasures of Hindu folklore, but this small collection of tales will doubtless suffice to throw light on Indian tradition, 
and to bring forward the natural peculiarities of the Hindus, as well as the assimilation of the folklore of different nations. An assimilation which I maintain results from the teaching propensities of each country, and not from appropriation. Georgiana Kingscote End of Preface and Introduction to Tales of the Sun or Folklore of Southern India Read by Step Heather, Bangalore, India, January 28, 2023「Fortifications for Peace」by Kiyoshi Karl Kawakami From Japan's Pacific Policy, especially in relation to China, the Far East, and the Washington Conference. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Washington, February 1, 1922 the much belated announcement of the Naval Armament Treaty is made at last. It was formally adopted at the fifth plenary session this morning, after a delay of some five weeks. For this undue delay, Japan is to blame, because its main cause has been her indecisive attitude toward the fortification question. Into the details of this treaty I need not enter. From the Japanese point of view, its most important features are the provisions on the capital ship ratio and the fortifications and naval bases in the Pacific Ocean. As for the naval ratio, it has been fully discussed in my previous letters. Here I must tell you the real involution of the fortification question. When the Japanese delegation failed to secure the alteration of the capital ship ratio, and was obliged to accept the 5 to 5 to 3 ratio, as originally proposed by the American delegation, Admiral Baron Katu approached Mr Hughes with a view to reach an agreement for the cessation of further work on the fortifications and naval bases in the Pacific. To this idea, the American delegation was favourably disposed. In several conversations between Hughes, Balfour and Gatou, it was agreed that the status quo should be maintained as to the fortifications and naval bases in the region of the Pacific, with the exception of Australia, New Zealand, the Hawaiian Islands and Japan proper. It was then understood that Japan proper did not include the Bonin Islands, and Amami Oshima, and that these islands should, therefore, come within the zone in which the status quo was to be maintained. In accordance with this interpretation, the original Article 19 was drafted. There is reason to believe that Admiral Katu readily subscribed to that interpretation. Whether he did so under definite instructions from the home government is not known. Certain it is that personally he saw no reason why the Bonin group should be excluded from the status quo zone. As on the ratio question, so on the fortification question, he proved very liberal and conciliatory. He felt assured that Japan's safety was fairly protected by the Four Power Pacific Treaty and the abandonment of the American project to develop naval bases at Guam and the Philippines. To the embarrassment of the Japanese delegation, however, the home government took the view that the Bonin Islands should be excluded from the status quo zone and that Japan should reserve the right to fortify them according to her own needs and discretion, because they formed part of Japan proper. I am inclined to think that the government at Tokyo took this attitude mainly because the United States reserved the right to strengthen the fortifications and naval bases in the Hawaiian Islands. Fair-minded critics must admit that this Japanese contention was not devoid of plausible reason. Hawaii is 2,100 sea miles from San Francisco, while the Bonin Group is only 500 sea miles from Japan. If America must keep on increasing the fortifications and naval bases on islands whose distance from its Pacific coast is about four times as great as the distance between Yokohama and the Bonin Group, Japan can reasonably advance strong arguments for the exclusion of that group from the status quo zone. Moreover, Pearl Harbor at Hawaii has already been converted into a magnificent naval base. If America really wished to be a harbinger of peace, and looked forward to an age of amity and friendliness in the Pacific Ocean, why should she be so eager to keep on strengthening a naval base already so well developed? It is quite likely that Admiral Katu wished to bring out the question of the Hawaiian fortifications in his conversations with Mr Hughes, but he knew the American intention on this matter too well to hazard a proposal. To an idealist, it seems regrettable that America could not have played Big Brother and decided of her own accord 
to stop work on the Hawaiian base. Acting upon instructions from Tokyo, Admiral Katu asked Mr. Hughes whether he would agree to an exclusion of the Bonin Islands from the status quo region. Here, Mr. Hughes was uncompromising. He would not listen to any proposal which would permit Japan to increase fortifications in the Bonin Group. As a compromise, Katu proposed that the Bonin Group should be eliminated from the naval treaty, but that Japan should sign a separate note pledging herself to maintain the status quo of the islands. Of course, this compromise was flimsy and meaningless, because there was no difference between a treaty and a note as far as its binding force was concerned. As long as Japan insisted upon the fundamental point, namely the exclusion of the Bonins from the status quo zone, she had good argument to back her. Once that point was conceded, there was no reason why she should hesitate to accept it in a treaty. And yet, Japan allowed this quibbling to delay the conclusion of the naval treaty for a month. The only plausible explanation for this peculiar Japanese attitude may be found in the prevalent opinion in Japan that no outside power should be allowed to determine what islands constituted Japan proper, and that Japan proper, as understood among the Japanese, included the Bonins, which are, strangely enough, under the direct control of the Metropolitan Government of Tokyo. It was a hackneyed conception of national dignity, or face, which entered the agreement. It was while Mr. Hughes and Admiral Katu were engaged in these unprofitable conversations that Mr. Balfour proposed the novel scheme of a parallelogram within which all fortifications and naval bases were to maintain the status quo. The boundary lines of this zone were to be the equator on the south, the 30th degree of latitude on the north, the 110th degree of longitude on the west, and the 180th degree of longitude on the east. In presenting this novel scheme, Britain, it was surmised, had in view the increase of fortifications on certain islands south of the equator, which were, in the original American plan, included in the status quo zone. It also permitted the strengthening of naval bases in the Aleutian group. At the same time, it put the Bonins within the zone where further fortifications were to be prohibited. Naturally, this was met with vigorous opposition on the part of Japan, and was finally abandoned. After protracted negotiations, Japan withdrew the contention that the Bonin Group be excluded from the status quo zone. Article 19 of the Naval Treaty, as finally agreed upon, reads as follows. The United States of America, the British Empire and Japan agree that the status quo at the time of the signing of the present treaty, with regard to fortifications and naval bases, shall be maintained in their respective territories and possessions specified hereunder. One. The insular possessions which the United States now holds or may hereafter acquire in the Pacific Ocean, except a. those adjacent to the coast of the United States, Alaska and the Panama Canal Zone, not including the Aleutian Islands, and b. the Hawaiian Islands. 2. Hong Kong and the insular possessions which the British Empire now holds or may hereafter acquire in the Pacific Ocean east of the meridian of 110 degrees east longitude except a. those adjacent to the coast of Canada, b. the Commonwealth of Australia and its territories, and c. New Zealand. 3. The following insular territories and possessions of Japan in the Pacific Ocean, to wit, the Kuril Islands, the Bonin Islands, Amami Oshima, Luchu Islands, Formosa and the Pescadores, and any insular territories or possessions in the Pacific Ocean which Japan may hereafter acquire. The maintenance of the status quo under the foregoing provisions implies no new fortifications or naval bases shall be established in the territories and possessions specified, that no measures shall be taken to increase the existing naval facilities for the repair and maintenance of naval force, and that no increase shall be made in the coast defence of the territories and possessions above specified. This restriction, however, does not preclude such repair and replacement of worn-out weapons and equipment as is customary in naval and military establishments in time of peace. The above article explains itself. Japan has foregone the right of increasing the fortifications of the Bonin Group and several other islands, but America is allowed that right with regard to the Hawaiian Group. As for Guam, no practical work has been commenced on the naval base project contemplated by the American government. The naval base in the Philippines has not yet assumed such a magnitude as to inspire fear in the Japanese mind. 
Although the fortifications there are understood to be formidable, they alone cannot become a menace to Japan's safety. As for Britain, she is well protected by her bases at Singapore and at Hong Kong. The maintenance of the existing status of the fortifications and naval bases, enumerated in Article 19 of the Naval Treaty, is calculated to remove a cause of mutual fear and suspicion among the powers. Let us hope that these Pacific fortifications will prove to be the fortifications for peace and not for war. Rumour has it that Article 19, as it now stands, was drafted by Baron Shidehara. It was a happy solution of the knotty problem, and was readily accepted by Mr Hughes and Mr Balfour. End of the Fortifications for Peace by Kiyoshi Karl Kawakami Have You an Educated Heart by Gillette Burgess This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Here the heart may give a useful lesson to the head, and learning wiser grow without his books. Cooper, The Task An Educated Heart now sadie i knew was temperamental sadie was sensitive but surely there wasn't quite enough in that dull musical comedy that afternoon to make any one weep but as i had noticed sadie dabbing at her eyes with her handkerchief off and on through the first act when the curtain went down i demanded the reason somewhat reluctantly sadie handed me a letter did you ever see anything as heartless as that she asked. It's about a package I sent to Eldora last week. I read it. Then, uncertainly, Why, I don't know, I replied. Seems all right enough to me. Ever so much obliged for the birthday package. What's the matter with that? Why, she might just as well have said, Yours of the sixteenth at hand and contents noted and as Sadie snatched back the letter she was already emptying the vials of her resentment. A while ago, it appeared, when she was visiting Sadie in New York, Eldora had raved over some fawn-coloured gloves she had seen, with those awfully wide black stitchings down the back. Though fairly weak after a bad attack of the flu, poor Sadie had tramped through shop after shop, from 34th Street to 56th Street last week, to find those particular gloves, actually fighting for them at the last with a mob of wild women at a bargain sale. Well, Sadie had gone and bought a fancy box. Sadie had wrapped that package with neatness and with fondest care. Sadie had walked twenty-one blocks, so she said, to a post office. Sadie had stood there in line for half an hour, more or less, to have it weighed and insured and I just loved it all. I loved doing it for Eldora, welled Sadie, and now all she says is that she is ever so much obliged. Oh, well, said I loftily, we oughtn't to give things just for the thanks, you know. Never mind the thanks, snapped Sadie, but did she like those gloves? Good gracious, you want to know whether you've pleased a person or not, don't you? Were they the right shade? Did they match her gown? Were they the size? Did they fit her? Has she worn them? Why, she might have said something about them. Well, at any rate, I offered in appeasement. She answered you promptly, that's something. Why, loads of people don't even acknowledge gifts at all nowadays. Yes, and that's just the point, declared Sadie. I've no doubt she thinks she's really quite polite and kind. Oh, she means well, I suppose. They all do. But the trouble with Eldora is simply that she hasn't got the educated heart. The educated heart? I queried, amused. What do you mean, the educated heart? The lady was growing a little calmer now. Why, I've called it that to myself so long that it seems as if everyone ought to understand. Well, it's this way. You know you can usually tell an educated man, can't you? There's something about him that's, 
oh i don't know extra finish it is perhaps distinction or something he knows how to but the educated heart i insisted prithee the educated heart why it's just the same with hearts as it is with heads quoth my mentor some hearts seem to be self-made you know rough dry unvarnished amateurish and then some hearts are just as if they'd been to college and had graduated in kindness they've got their b k or d k even sometimes yes i know at least one doctor of kindness why i mean oh they have that extra touch of consideration thoughtfulness you know imagination and oh dear why do we like to have flowers on the dinner table they're not necessary of course but doesn't that extra touch always make the soup taste perfectly wonderful it's all the difference between just eating and dining ever see a woman without style jam on a beautiful hat and make it look like a waste basket well some people are like that when they try to be kind style that's what it is it's just style in kindness that most people lack oh it's the rarest thing in the world the educated heart the educated heart late that night alone i pondered it midnight and it still haunted me the educated heart super kindness she might have called it she might have called it tact vainly i tried to coin a new word for it but at the end sadie's simple term stayed with me the educated heart and so using that test i found myself at length classifying my friends and first of all came christabel last october you see i sent christabel a book she acknowledged it and promptly but two months afterward hadn't she yes she actually had written me another letter telling me what she thought of that book and she proved moreover that she had read it actually read it now reader i ask you isn't that a strange and beautiful experience in this careless world yes christabel had the educated heart indeed receiving simply receiving is one of the greatest tests of the educated heart to such as possess it thanks are something like mortgages to be paid in installments why after five years christabel often refers to a gift that has pleased her yes and lies about it too sometimes mind you i didn't say that christabel was always really sincere i said that she was really kind she may dislike that gift exceedingly she may stick it up in the garret or give it to her laundress but christabel having the educated heart appreciates kindness in others it is the motive for that gift she cares for not its value and hence her tactful iterated gratefulness but the others oh the thousand negligent others you give your friend a bottle of perfume she thanks you and pop it goes immediately into a bureau drawer and she begins to talk about harry's wife you give her a lovely veil and right before your incredulous eyes she wads it into a bunch jams it into her bag and takes another chocolate that bunch of jonquils you brought the invalid haven't you seen it carried off into some far corner as if it were deadly mandragora or hustled into a miscellaneous mass of wholesale offerings and the subject hurriedly changed last month i visited my young cousin frisia why what a pretty jet necklace they all cried at dinner in pleased self-conscious expectancy i waited for frisia to say oh yes my cousin brought it to me did she no not a word except oh do you like it i should have been grateful i suppose that my little cousin even wore that necklace haven't you too often moaned i shot a present into the air it fell to earth i know not where why there are innumerable ways of insulting the giver of a present listen for instance to this acknowledgment from zeroine all my life she wrote i have given away pink azaleas to my friends 
and this is the first time I ever received one. How's that for egoism? Compared to her noble, extravagant, and advertised generosity, didn't my one gift loom pretty small? Rather clever she is, that Zeroine, a positive genius sometimes, you know them, at making one wish one hadn't tried to be nice to her. As the bride of one of my cronfrères, I met her first in Paris. To celebrate her marriage, I racked my brains for something charming enough with which to greet a new friend. Something not costly, you know, yet perfect and unique. Well, the loveliest things of that sort I had found were the marvellous ribbon roses made by the Comtesse de la Monde for the benefit of the widows of officers. Every one is a work of art a beautiful and faithful portrait of some particular rose from her own garden on the Marne. To her house on the Avenue Malakoff I went, her only son, last of his line, had just been killed at the front, but her work must go on, and three exquisite William Allen Richardsons I picked out from all the rest. Late that night, too impatient to wait, through the narrow, shuttered, unlighted Paris streets I walked, no taxicabs in those war days, over the river to deliver my initiatory tribute at Zeroine's hotel, and with it I left a letter telling her the rose's pathetic story. This is what Zeroine replied. Yes, I know the de Lamont roses. They're lovely. I saw the wife of the ambassador wearing one last week and got the address. I have been intending to buy some of them, but you have kindly saved me the trouble. But for the most extraordinary misunderstanding of all that gifts should mean, I think I must, after all, award the prize to Mrs. Hilking. The Christmas tree that day at Mrs. Hilking's was heavily hung with presents. Piled deep on the floor they were. Mrs. Hilking was happy. Oh, she was awfully happy. Didn't she have a good reason to be happy? Why, gurgled Mrs. Hilking so proudly, baby has received so many, many Christmas presents that I didn't have to give him a single one myself. Selah. Do you begin to see now what Sadie meant by style in kindness? Style is what a smart hat has, isn't it? It's what an expensive motor car has, or a beautiful dancer. It's the perfect technique of any artist. A successful clergyman, or a good novelist, or a clever burglar such as Mr. Raffles. In short, style is a combination of good taste and imagination. Then what is style in giving? To give what you'd like yourself may be kindness, but the educated heart isn't quite satisfied even with the golden rule. It amends, or rather translates it, thus. Whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, were ye such as they, do ye even so to them. But perhaps you don't know what your friend wants. Ah, but the educated heart makes it its business to know, to remember, or to find out. A man's heart, you know, deviseth his way. One friend I have to whom I can't express a taste or desire that isn't treasured up against need. If I happen to mention liking a Japanese writing set, it is only a question of time when that set is mine. I said to the Prandials once that I loved watercress, and lightly wished that I might have it for every meal. Never a meal have I ever had at the Prandials' table since then without finding watercress bought specially for me. Do you think it's easy, this business of giving? Verily, verily, I say unto you, giving is as much of an art as portrait painting or the making of glass flowers. There really ought to be a four years course in the art of making presents in every college for those who are not born intelligently generous. In one's freshman year, one would be taught, perhaps, not to present an $85 inlaid umbrella with a gold dog's head handle with rhinestone eyes, to a gentleman of culture like Mr. Richard Mansfield, for instance, as was once done one Christmas by an ardent but unillumined friend. If a lady has saved your son's life, 
the educated heart doesn't reward her by offering her chastely appointed apartment a two-ton carved ebony chair upholstered in red plush oh no it's not easy people nowadays haven't the artless gratitude of that easily satisfied girl who used to sing he promised to bring me a bunch of blue ribbons to tie up my bonny brown hair the people i know usually prefer to select their own ribbons and gloves and boudoir caps and neckties rather than have them chosen however expensively by well by those who do sometimes have the audacity to choose them for you now taste you will say cannot be disputed each one has his own perhaps it can't even be educated we'll see later but imagination surely can be brought to bear suppose we suggest a few ways in illustration are you sailing for italy ah it isn't the basket of fine fat fruits that brings the tears to your eyes nor the flowers with trailing yards and yards of red ribbon all that's mere kindness ordinary everyday kindness even the vanderbilts can do that but it's the things oh it's the things mr rockefeller never would think of it's that little purse full of italian currency bills and small change all ready for you when you first trip ashore at genoa it's the little nest of spools of colored silk minnie made for you to catch up the first threatened run in your stocking i may oh yes i may forget the three hundred dollars you lent me that time i was broke but the little corkscrew you so thoughtfully added when you gave me that bottle of your pet malt extract that i shall never never forget no he didn't have much style i admit to his dented dusty derby poor old westrose but god bless him his heart was certainly up to date he may have got a lady's coat upside down occasionally when he helped her on with it but he understood the fourth dimension of kindness all right never a friend of his wife's did he ever puffingly put aboard a street car but he'd tuck apologetically into her hand the nickel to save her rummaging in her bag real elegance the gesture of inherent nobility i call that it's like the flourish to the signature of charles dickens it's kindness with a kick to it in short it's the manner and custom of the educated heart that makes you turn over at night and decide to add a codicil to your will why should brother fred have it all well knows the educated heart that the doctor's clients usually pay slowly and itself therefore pays without delay which lover has the educated heart he who orders the florist to send every day five dollars worth of flowers or he who himself selects and presents a single rose ask the sweetheart she knows that tis not so much the gallant who woos as the gallant's way of wooing i'm so sorry i couldn't send you anything this christmas said millicent but i've been awfully hard up too hard up in fact to afford two cents to stamp a letter sending her love and now i beseech you consider the usual christmas present no one but a boor would present a diamond wrapped in a scrap of newspaper would he no and so the most trivial of gifts when sent by a civilized donor on christmas is by universal practice carefully wrapped in a pretty paper red or gold is tied with a fancy ribbon and decorated mayhap with a sprig of holly now that's what i mean by the educated heart that package is symbolical of what all friendly acts should be kindness performed with style is it sufficient then simply to offer your seat in a street car to a woman the merely kind person does that but he does it rather sheepishly isn't your graciousness more cultured if you give it up with a bow with a smile of willingness besides the quarter you give the beggar can't you give a few cents worth of yourself too so everything can be done beautifully by the educated heart from the lacing of a shoe so that it won't come loose to passing the salt before it is asked for 
even if you say only good morning it can be done pleasingly observe how the polished actor says it with that cheerful rising english inflection but the ordinary american growls it out with such surly downward emphasis that in london he is apt to be asked what's the matter old chap headache why merely to speak distinctly is a great kindness i consider you never have to ask what did you say to the educated heart an old maid i knew once confessed that the only proposal she ever received was from a timid low-voiced suitor whose question she failed to hear lucky escape we all agreed you might have married him and been tormented all your life by his mumbling of course you've heard that he gives twice who gives quickly but how about the giver who gives but half his gift it isn't the procrastinator i mean the half giver is one who wearies in well-doing stops part way on the road to kindness with the goal plainly in sight if you want to have the educated heart you must dot all the i's and cross the t's otherwise your gift is apt to be as the grapefruit without the sugar half giving instances of such gold-plated parsimonious generosity i could cite all day from the old-fashioned thrifty housewife who used to cut all the buttons off the clothes before she gave them to the poor to sweet sympathetic oval who visited an invalid oh i'm so sorry she said i bought the loveliest bunch of roses for you but i forgot them left them in the hotel and oval after that although the flowers of course never came fully expected to be credited with a kindness oh you know them you must know them the half-giver who invites his party to supper after the theatre but fails to reserve a table how surprised and apologetic he is to find all the places taken the gent who escorts his lady to the theatre too and when they come out exclaims gee doesn't this fresh air seem good after that stuffy house let's walk away how bright his smile truly the heart as well as the clothes can be shabby genteel that kind of liberality he has that many women possess oh yes they insist upon paying for their half of the dinner but they always forget to share the tips you remember those liberty loan subscribers who used to say i'll subscribe one thousand if you'll take another that's the way these half-givers usually leave you to complete their gifts or go and get them or something to pay some part of the price yourself anyway in trouble or in work dear alfred dean was kind enough to bring her friend from abroad several pairs of earrings but alas as they were made for those grandmothery old pierced ears her friend had to pay a jeweler to have them fitted with screw fastenings just nine dollars a sum she could ill afford at least for earrings i'd rather not try please said alice i'm quite content to stay here only i am so hot and thirsty i know what you'd like the queen said good-naturedly taking a little box out of her pocket have a biscuit kind you may think you are and never know you are not kind and worse than all the rest are those who force their presence on you my indulgent uncle once presented me with theatre tickets to see bernhardt now it so happened that day that at the last moment i had the opportunity to meet a man a famous man whom i had long wanted to know and who proved to be of the greatest help to me when i told my uncle was he pleased to hear of my good luck not at all never did he forgive me for not using his tickets how many men who have taken the pains to secure a friend a good position are pleased to hear that he himself has discovered a better one only those with the educated heart like my uncle most care more for that self-flattering glow of kindliness than for another's best happiness whoever really forgave you for being ill and missing a dinner engagement you had no right to be ill 
you gave your kind hostess a great deal of trouble and disappointment with that ptomaine poisoning of yours be happy my way says the parent marry this nice rich man i have chosen for you not the poor fellow you love but no putting a cushion behind a man in an armchair isn't kindness unless he happens to want it there it may make him uncomfortable and dear old country grandmother who used to urge on us nay force on us that third generous helping of pudding grandma's heart was big enough but it wasn't quite the right shape what's the rarest thing in all the world intelligent sympathy why well each one of us is working out his own evolution i suppose and our own interests must be paramount and absorb us or we lose in the race still it is rather pleasing to recall in pessimistic moods upon receiving a letter written in lead pencil for instance or one undated or with no address or most irritating of all with an illegible signature it is even encouraging to recall that it isn't always these inconsiderate unimaginative egoistic people after all who succeed most brilliantly in the world sometimes a good plain writer desirous of making it easy for his reader gets to the top too god bless him and my faith in kindness as a policy is restored too by the glaring fact that of all my acquaintances the one least to be suspected of an inferiority complex is the only one who begins a telephone conversation by decently introducing himself be ganning talking instead of peremptorily demanding my name like a census man breaking in the door as many of our acquired habits like walking for instance have been passed from the domain of the conscious to the subconscious and become automatic so perhaps with the behavior of the educated heart you set it in the direction of true kindness and courtesy and it will function without deliberate thought and alas vice versa it steers as well towards selfishness and now right here before i find more fault do please get my point of view am i fastidious why all i ask is an unadulterated drop of your emotion am i querulous why should i be no one is important enough to hurt me surely the very inadequacy of their feelings proves these skim milk saints to be unworthy the time and energy it takes to resent or protest am i ungrateful not if you have done the least friendly act and done it wholly do i demand too much pay for my favors if i long for a little of the old-time courtesy to color life must you accuse me of preferring the glib lace-sleeved powdered hair flattery of the french salons not at all these modern downright shirt-sleeved ways of ours open air golf playing ways man and woman give and take ways making up the jocose and slangy warfare we call friendship nowadays they're well enough so long as the thought beneath is honest but mere words 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 aren't you too sick of them don't you want deeds or nothing actions speak louder for the fact is that such thoughtfulness such consideration as i desire is not merely decorative it is the very essence and evidence of sincerity without it all so-called kindness is merely titular and perfunctory tact is what makes kindness real makes it effective just as the perfume proves which is the genuine and which is the artificial violet suppose i propose your name for membership in my club have i done you or my club any real service unless i also do my best to see that you are elected so then if i go to every member of the committee if i urge all my friends to endorse you is that a quixotic feeling for punctilio i think not it is merely the completion of my regard for you it is like salt it's what makes potatoes taste bad if you don't put it on it is a guarantee of my true feeling it is the hug without which the kiss means nothing 
neither do i insist on obedience to custom you may violate any of the folk ways for all i care if you refuse to take off your hat to ladies i shall think only that you do not feel yourself bound by the elaborate rules of romantic love concocted by the lazy troubadours and sentimental chatelaines of the middle ages offer your left hand to me if you like i care not we carry no daggers now i know that most of us would prefer to dine with a polite murderer than with an honest tinsmith who eats with his knife but by that same token i know that all such artificial distinctions are not based upon kindness they are merely the unwritten laws of society but if you however brilliantly make fun of your wife if you humiliate an inferior insult a debtor if you promise and keep not your word if you fail to flavor your kindness with sincerity if you give only the counterfeit money of politeness then i perceive that you have not the educated heart indeed the educated heart is rare enough anywhere but it is found quite as often among those who know not your artificial social code as it is with those of the six fork dinner aha now you think you have me in the old conventional corner by the altruistic what-not and the goody-goody seashells eh copy-book stuff mass morality herd-minded optimism that finds good in everything and why find fault it's not constructive but no i'm not trying to prove tis only noble to be good but only that to be good or even pleasing is a severe aesthetic problem well i know that hearts just as pure and fair may beat in belgrave square as in the lowly air of seven dials but at the same time one of the highest orders of the educated heart i must tell you is found in the criminal classes you stagger yes i repeat in the crook himself doesn't the confidence man for instance do everything in the power of his trained imagination in his first approaches at least to make his victim happy doesn't he study his come-ons every whim and taste is there any one more tactful and polite more considerate and anxious to please than a shoplifter oh charming truly charming thoughtful and heart wise must he be who marries eleven wives even though afterwards he murders them for the insurance money and buries them all in the cellar he knows how to anticipate his victim's least desire well why not be as shrewd as the crook then yourself to discover what will please and satisfy the friend you love get rich quick wallingford had a perverted heart tis true but it had taken its degree in the art of pleasing not much like your millionaires who ask their poor relatives you don't mind sitting in front with the chauffeur do you or give their country cousins horrible little black hats with a stick up in the back must you dance with all the wallflowers then and always be nice to old ladies well no i won't go so far as that although that too would certainly show an educated heart it would prove that you had imagination enough anyway to put yourself in another's place no all i ask is that when you try to do a favor to be kind you do it to the full length of your rope don't send your telegram collect or in just ten carefully selected words economize elsewhere but add those few extra phrases that make the reader grin and perceive that you cared more for him than you did for the expense no one with the educated heart ever approached a clergyman or a celebrity or a long absent visitor with the shocking greeting oh mr spoop you don't remember me do you no he gives his name first no one with the educated heart ever said now do come and see me some time well he knows that that merely means don't come at all the educated heart's way of putting it is apt to be how about next wednesday and strongly i doubt even if the educated heart is ever tardy at that appointment it knows that even if only two minutes late 
a person has brought just that much less of himself. Oh, he came, yes, and we put over the deal after all. But forever you will remember that he made you wait. You understand, don't you, that I'm not trying to discuss unkindness or even impoliteness? nor merely legitimate half-kindness do I mean. It would be absurd to assert that one shouldn't say, Here, you may have this hat, I don't like it. But wouldn't it be still more absurd to call that sort of thing kindness? No, what I impugn are thoughtless attempts to be kind. Slipshod sentimentality masquerading as kindness. Near-sighted benevolence. Generosity run down at the heels like the husband who conceives himself to be liberal because he gives his wife money, though she always has to ask him for it. Why, even in conversation, there is plenty of chance for the educated heart. Of course, unless you are a moron, you must have found out by this time that very few people ever really listen. They are usually merely waiting for a chance to say something themselves. It may be laid down as an axiom, then, that no habitual talker can have the educated heart. Even though these wordy pests go through all the motions of listening, say, oh, and ah, and really is that so? And how awful! The moment you close your lips, they pounce upon you with their own narrative. Or if, peradventure, they do listen, is the story of your trials or disappointments heard with real sympathy? Not often. Your illness, your divorce, your losses? You are merely providing them with a more or less amusing entertainment. Why, one of the best ways to make yourself popular, an infallible way, is to tell a story upon yourself. Give yourself the worst of it, and they'll all roar." But did anyone ever laugh with joy when you informed him that you had made $10,000 or won a beauty prize? How faint, oh, how pale are their congratulations! The lips move, but does the face really glow? Tell them you fell down two flights of stairs, though, and you'll see a fine abandon of mirth. They'll slap you on the back, by Jove, and invite you to dinner, so that you can repeat it to the wife. You think I'm fooling? Not at all. A psychological fact it is that, in nine cases out of ten, if you tell of an accident of which you're the victim, your hearer will instantly laugh. Just try it yourself and see. Oh, of course, if you paint a vivid enough picture, if you say, I had three ribs and a shoulder blade broken and four others were killed, then possibly you may awaken their sympathy but the ordinary tale of suffering has pretty hard work getting more than half an inch inside people's ears. Women love to tell of their operations, I hear, but do they love to listen? Doesn't everyone smile when you say you haven't slept a wink all night? Yes, all, save the one with the educated heart, and he's your sweetheart probably. Queer, but the world, alas, is very hard of hearing. Unless people see the blood actually streaming, every sufferer is considered merely as a comedian. The banana peel joke is still typical of our reactions to another's woes. And so, it is my fearful opinion that but seldom has the educated heart a keen sense of humor. Didn't an eminent mid-Victorian advise, Be good, sweet maid, and let who will be clever. Aren't you already thinking over your own friends? Am I not right? Is it the sparkling bright apostle of pleasantry to whom you go to borrow that ten dollars, or to the serious, kindly dub who never sees the point? Which dentist is most apt to drill that horrid millimeter too far into a shrieking nerve? He who tells you diverting anecdotes the while, or the solemn conscientious drudge? To whom do you tell your troubles, the agile wit, or the bromide-minded, solid, respectable Philistine, your uncle with the shoestring tie? No, no, oh no, my friend, you can't be too quick on the comic trigger if you would have the educated heart. 
there is a time to weep and a time to laugh said the preacher the educated heart knows well how to control his mirth you call once or twice at the hospital do you ever call again not unless you have the educated heart yet the patient is still perhaps quite as ill the plain truth is if you must know it most people really dislike illness it bores them it interferes with their happiness and convenience it thrusts upon them too a disagreeable burden of sympathy but one there was do you remember will you ever forget who used to bring that cute scrapbook every morning pasted in with funny newspaper items of the day's news one there was who wrote you letters every day one who rescued the clock that always had something in front of it so you couldn't see the time who was careful never to hit the bed who talked to you yes to poor sick you instead of to the distinguished caller who happened to be present but still i insist i don't mean mere kindness others were kind to you they bought you things but such acts as these required more thought and invention than the others spent when they sent the jelly and champagne and oh what do these uneducated hearts do at your first brave smile though the effort kills you at your first would-be would-be cheerful letter or at your first timorous step on crutches they beam oh how they beam oh you're all right now aren't you it may pain you for months to breathe you may limp on that broken ankle to your grave but it's much more convenient for them to have you well again and so isn't it lovely you're cured ask any invalid ask poor lorraine i'm afraid i'll have to wear glasses wept poor lorraine after that accident when her eye was injured well my dear said her would-be comforter i do hope you'll get some of those smart tortoise-shell goggles they're so becoming and that ladies and gentlemen is what often passes for sympathy ask any partially deaf person who is the cruelest of her would-be friends isn't it that kind and thoughtless one who says so sweetly why i think you get along awfully well you know really no one would ever know that you can't hear no one but the educated heart ever knows or cares for the tearful nights of wild revolt the days and years of stoic suffering that remain just the same yes just the same but let's pass now to the last cage in our menagerie here's a dangerous galravaging beast one of those terrible creatures who mean well even while they rend you one historic remark of this emotional reptile there is that in the annals of mental torture surpasses in heartlessness all other expressions of good intent oh i have said it you have too i suppose may god forgive us both for there are those who never never will galna it was who has dramatized it for me best a dreadful suicide it was no horror lacking galna alone in the house alone save for her maid and that shocking wreck of one she had loved and in her anguish her despair her bewilderment the telephone bell rang lo mrs spick kind effusive mrs spick had rung her up to coo conventional condolence and now if there is anything i can do galna she concluded be sure and let me know ah my friend some time you too must have suffered suffered and know not where to turn and as sure as most hearts alas are ignorant some time you too must have heard that frightful phrase that mockery of friendship the very epitaph it is upon the grave of affection if there is anything i can do be sure and let me know but as galna dazed lonely aching staggered back to her room behold upon her bed she saw an unfamiliar thing tear-blinded she groped for it a hundred-dollar bill 
why where did this come from she asked wondering oh miss felice left it there said her maid she thought perhaps you might happen to be short of money felice yes she's downstairs now helping wash the dishes and putting the parlor to rights and sending telegrams ah felice needed no one to let her know what to do she had imagination she had the educated heart for the educated heart always knows he seeth with his heart the language of suffering ordinarily can no more be learned without experience than can the language of mars but upon some blessed few in this world thank god has fallen the gift of tongues truly as sadie said nothing is so rare as the educated heart and if you wonder why just show a kodak group picture a banquet photograph a photograph of a class what does every one of us first look at talk about ourself and that's the reason why most hearts are so unlearned in kindness yet none of us likes himself to be forgotten or neglected almost any wife i verily believe would prefer actual rudeness to having a husband pass over her wedding anniversary unnoticed even a blow would prove that she was of some importance in his life so it isn't always the big climactic misfortune that we suffer from most we can rally after we're stunned and go on somehow but it's the little stings that we can't forget it's because of the uneducated heart that love mad women kill why don't you get a smart hat like carrie's dear she's always so well dressed yes and because of the uneducated hearts of their wives husbands grow seedy silly and old why one can tell almost by the looks of a man his posture his very clothes whether or not his wife truly loves him for many a wife dubbed by his undiscerning friends a shrew a harridan has proved her real interest in him by so ballyragging him for his faults that he has despite himself improved to meet her criticism become ambitious become persevering and successful while as many others have been slowly kissed and praised into an intellectual apathy most affectionately murdered by the uneducated heart ah tis not only cats and lapdogs that are killed with kindness there is another side to the mary and martha story i know them well those two sisters mary loves martha well she will tell you and be shocked at your question but dear martha is before her time an old woman round-shouldered bowed down by caring for others in the years has mary ever said straighten up dear you are growing crooked not once her own head high she walks beside a sister almost deformed whom with an educated heart she could have saved from ugliness and by this time you'll understand of course that the educated heart isn't really educated at all in the sense that it has had to learn how to be kind it merely is wise its gesture is instinctive its knowledge innate but you ask can't the uneducated heart be instructed don't the churches and sunday schools teach how to be good how about the books of ethics ah the trouble with them all is that they teach what to do but not how to do it and the trouble with this little study will be perhaps if you and i don't look out that it will educate us as to others faults but lead us to forget our own it is so easy to be petulant and critical it's so easy to deny that we ourselves are morally round-shouldered if you have even the rudiments of a heart culture long before this you will be saying to yourself have i an educated heart so if you are not content with increasing your chest expansion or your biceps if you want to enlarge that mystic organ whence flows true kindness you must cultivate your imagination you must learn to put yourself in another's place think his thoughts 
there is but one substitute for imagination, and that is experience. If you have deeply suffered, perhaps you may have found, from your very pain, what real kindness is. Like Confucius, you may have learned politeness from the impolite. And if you haven't, well, I scarcely think it should be necessary for you to break a leg or inoculate yourself with the germs of typhoid. You might do a great deal, really, by exercising just your common sense. Take a little thought, therefore, upon what style really is. In costume, you'll see that style is not what most people, but what the best people wear. If you wished to be strictly up to date, then, you'd go to the leading shops for your clothes, wouldn't you? You'd haunt the opera, the smartest assemblies, the most aristocratic homes, to see what fashionable people selected. If you wanted to learn modern surgery, you'd visit the clinic of the most eminent surgeon, wouldn't you, to observe his technique? Then, if you desire to be really kind, elegantly kind, artistically kind, why not seek the highest authorities on kindness, and emulate their expert taste and method? Wherefore, let me recommend to you the greatest examples of altruistic love, past masters of sympathetic consideration, whose kindness is directed by an inspired imagination. Two perfect exponents of the educated heart there are, only two, but I am sure you have known them. The mother, who sees her child as truly a part of herself, and the true lover, whose imagination is fired with romance. In those two is most perfectly manifest the love which passeth understanding. Forever, unconsciously, they demonstrate the radiant truth, the heart hath its reasons, which the reason knoweth not of. End of Have You an Educated Heart by Gillette Burgess Jackie Coogan and the Kid by Samuel Goldwyn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Merritt. The few superfluities which appeal to Charlie Chaplin must have some association of romance. For example, he is very fond of mangoes, and every evening that a certain Los Angeles cafe has this delicacy, the manager calls up Chaplin's house. When Charlie sits down in front of a glass of this exotic fruit, he is positively radiant. Lovely, musty odor, he will comment. To him, the delicacy calls up visions of long-robed, wide-sleeved eastern men, of caravans winding thread-like across the desert, and of incense rising in fretted temples from the feet of of golden gods. Every bit of him goes out to meet this glamorous suggestion, just exactly as every bit of him goes out to meet the broad, rollicking humor of the derby pulled off by the string. Domesticity does not fit into my conception of his character. He is too individual, too much oppressed by threat of routine to sustain any such close relationship. One can as easily imagine De Musset or Velin mowing the front lawn of his suburban home as Chaplin responding contentedly to like conditions. My association of his name with these two great French poets is not accidental, for Chaplin is not a mere comedian. He is a poet, the great poet of the screen. His fierce rebellions against man-made fetters, which would trammel the individual soul in its progress toward complete expression, his sensitiveness to impression, his strange combination of emotionality and complete detachment, these ally him in spirit with the youngest and fiercest of bards. 
Surely, too, his professional achievement is consistent with this spirit. For Chaplin has brought from the borderland of the subconscious mind those emotions which he sets before you. In that single small figure with the baggy trousers and the flopping shoes, he reveals the loneliness and frailty, the lurking irresponsibility, the fears and the aspirations. All the intermingled pathos and humor of the universal soul. Shoulder arms, for example. Here Charlie bears for you the real every man at war. Stripped of his bombast and fine speeches, of the brave front which he presents to his fellows, the soldier stands stark before you. It is a poet's realization of those things buried beneath the surface of garb and manner and everyday speech, and it is all of a poet's concrete expression of them. One evening when I was dining with Chaplin in Los Angeles, a very smartly dressed woman, leading a small boy by the hand, entered the restaurant. The moment that the latter caught sight of the comedian, he rushed over to him and threw his arms about Chaplin's neck. There was a look of rapture in the big brown eyes which I have never forgotten. After the enthusiasm of this greeting had ebbed away, Charlie introduced the pair. It was Jackie Coogan and his mother. When they had moved on from our table, Chaplin turned to me. There's a boy you ought to have, he commented. He's a great actor. Possibly Chaplin never shone more brightly in any human relationship than he has in his association with Jackie Coogan. The tremendous love and tenderness which he expressed for the kid on the screen had, in fact, a source of actual feeling. He really loved and does love the small boy. As to the latter, I have already indicated in my account of his greeting how touchingly Jackie returns this affection. If you ask the tiny star today who is his best friend, his answer is prompt, Charlie Chaplin. Equally loyal is the professional sting he gives to his friend. One day, somebody asked him who was the greatest living actor. Charlie Chaplin, of course, he retorted. And who is the second greatest, persisted the interviewer. Jackie Coogan, he answered, with all the serenity of the critical mind that is unshaken by any personal consideration. And the third. Oh, said he, obviously somewhat impatient with the doggedness of this research. I have told you the two greatest. What does it matter about the third? Even in that first casual greeting with this gifted boy, I was struck by the perfect unconsciousness which sets Jackie apart from the ordinary stage child. He didn't seem to realize in the least that he was a famous personage, and I hear that it has been kept from him always. The enormity of his earning, the fact that he, a lad not quite eight years old, has already earned almost a million dollars. Certainly that evening he was just a kid, radiant at seeing the grown-up who had played games with him much more absorbedly than any other small boy could have done. Indeed, I have always been told in Hollywood by people who knew the Coogans well that he is, first of all, a real boy possessing perhaps even more than the average boy's affinity with dirt. Not long ago, a friend of mine dropped in to see the small star. It was during the production of Oliver Twist, and the set was preempted by some older members of the company. For a time, Jackie, attired in blue overalls, listened to the director's voice 
and watched the rival talent. Then, going over to his father, he caught the other's hand and looked up appealingly into his face. Oh, Daddy, he pleaded. I'm not getting any kick out of this. Mayn't I go outside and play? When this permission was granted, Jackie availed himself of an opportunity to assemble his favorite playthings. These consist of a hammer, some old nails, and a plot of ground outside the studio. Here, for half an hour, the juvenile actor who might recruit the most costly electrical toys. These have been showered upon him by people all over the world, squatted on the ground and hammered his beloved nails into stray pieces of wood. While he was thus occupied, the friend I have mentioned happened to refer to the gold chain she was wearing as looking like a royal decoration. The Order of the Golden Fleece, she added laughingly, to the group of the older people watching with her over Jackie's recreation. He stopped his hammering for an instant, and quickly, with a look of most eager intelligence, he lifted his eyes to her face. The Golden Fleece, he repeated. Oh, I know all about that. It's what Jason sailed after. I quote this to show the information already at the command of this astounding lad. All I have heard from Chaplin and from others convinces me, in fact, that his histrionic ability is accompanied by one of those childish minds which work in all directions, which positively have to be held back from learning too much. One incident in connection with the production of The Kid throws into relief Chaplin's feeling for his small co-star. He was directing the child in a particularly affecting scene when suddenly he turned to Jackie's father. You direct him. I can't stand it, he said, turning away quickly. The child's tears, even though histrionic ones, had been too much for the high-strung emotional chaplain. Charlie's devotion to Jackie Coogan is explicable to me after one glimpse of the child. So, too, are the words of a certain woman I know. There is something about that boy, says the latter, that always makes me feel like crying. I don't know why, for he seems so gay and happy. I myself caught in an instant that same touching, even solemn, quality. What is it? Perhaps because in those wide, childish eyes, one feels a wisdom brought from some other world, and not yet dimmed by that of this. I feel that I cannot bring my recollections of Chaplin to a close at a point more deeply significant of his artist's nature than the account of my own preview of the kid. When he finished with this picture, attended as it was by his conflict with Mildred Harris, he was in an abysmal state. Sam, said he one day, I wish when you have nothing else to do, you'd come over to my studio and look at my new picture. I'd like to get your opinion of it. Advice, too, if you have any to offer. What do you think of it? I asked him. Rotten, he answered. I'm awfully discouraged over it. I had heard such comments from him before on similar occasions. For by the time that he has finished a story, he has so completely lost all sense of perspective that nobody can convince him that the production has one glimmering ray of merit. Consequently, I attached no importance to this mood of his. Putting down his words to the divine discontent of genius, I went over that very day with Governor Morris to see the kid.
even my prejudice in favor of anything that Charlie does, did not prepare me for this supreme manifestation of his artistry. Just as the world was afterward to do, Morris and I laughed and cried and gasped as the wonderful story unrolled before us. As for Charlie, he looked at us unbelievingly. He simply could not make himself understand that we were not feigning this appreciation. Charlie, I said, after it was all over, if you never had done or never should do another picture, your name would go down into history as the creator of the kid. With that peculiarly eager, wistful expression of his, he looked at me. You really think it's good, then? he asked. You're not just saying this to make me feel encouraged. If you don't believe me, I answered, I'll call in a few others to help convince you. I tell you, I added, let me do something, won't you? Let me give a dinner over at my studio, and then we'll show them the kid. Very reluctantly, he agreed. I thereupon sent out invitations and I don't suppose there was ever a more brilliant constellation of names represented at any Hollywood celebration than that afforded by this preview of The Kid at the Goldwyn Studio. Among authors, we had Sir Gilbert Parker, Somerset Maugham, Eleanor Glenn, Edward Knobloch, Mrs. Gertrude Atherton, Rupert Hughes, Rex Beach, and Rita Wyman. Among the most famous personalities of the screen were Elsie Ferguson and Pauline Frederick. As this group began to concentrate upon the picture, Charlie, who had been intensely nervous throughout the course of the dinner, seemed stricken with terror. I have attended many previews in my life, but never have I seen anything like the enthusiasm with which the kid was greeted by these distinguished people of pen and screen and stage. Tears streamed down the faces of many of the women and some of the men. Shouts of laughter were interspersed with cries of applause. Yet still little Chaplin, sitting here beside me, could not believe in the miracle of success. Do you really think they like it? Are you sure it's going over? He would whisper to me from time to time. I doubt if he was convinced, even after the performance, when many of the women went up and threw their arms about him, and when even the men forgot Anglo-Saxon reserve in their congratulations. One amusing glint from the evening is struck by a word of Eleanor Glenn's. During the course of the dinner, she happened to tell us all that she had never in her life seen more than one picture. But when, at the end of the evening, a newspaper man present asked Mrs. Glenn how she liked the kid, she answered with prompt soulfulness, The finest picture I ever saw in my life. I have no doubt that by this time, she had persuaded herself of broad facilities of comparison. End of Jackie Coogan and the Kid by Samuel Goldwyn The Book Lover and His Books by Harry Lyman Koopman Parchment Bindings This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There are certain things, the autocrat informs us, that are good for nothing until they've been kept a long while, and some are good for nothing until they have been kept and used. Of the first, wine is the illustrious and immortal example. Of those which must be kept and used, I will name three, meerschaum pipes, violins, and poems. May we present another representative of the class which gathers value 
with the process of the sons, as one immortal and historic as wine, and even richer in associations. The parchment book cover. In this case, it matters not whether the object meets with use or neglect, so long as it is not actually worn to pieces on the one hand, nor destroyed by mold on the other. The parchment binding will keep on converting time into gold, until after a few hundred years it reaches a tint far surpassing in beauty the richest umber of a meerschaum, and approached only by the kindred hue of antique ivory. Here is a table full of old parchment-bound books, ranging from a tiny twenty-formo, which will stay neither open nor shut, to thin limp folios that are instantly correspondent to either command. Those that are bound with boards have taken on a drumhead quality of smoothness and tension, especially the fat quartos and the small octavos, while the larger volumes that received a flexible binding resemble nothing in surface so much as the wrinkled diploma on yonder wall, with its cabalistic signature now to be written no more, Carolus Gill, Elliot. But all agree in a tint over which artists rave, the color that gold would take if it were capable of stain. But there is no stain here, or rather all stains, are taken up and converted into beauty. Dust, dirt, smudges, all are here and each is made to contribute a new element of charm. Is the resultant more beautiful than the spotless original? Compare it with the pearly tint of the diploma, or turn up the folded edge of one of those flexible bindings and note the chalky white of the parchment's protected undersurface. The same 300 years that have made over Europe and made English America have, as it were, filled in the rhythmic pauses between their giant heartbeats by ripening Dr. Holmes' wine and touching with Midas' caress these parchment bindings. It is surely a crime to keep such beauty of tint and tone hidden away in drawers or all but hidden on crowded shelves. Let them be displayed in open cases where all may enjoy them. But let us go softly. These century mellowed parchments are too precious to be displayed to unappreciative, perhaps scornful eyes. Put them away in their hiding places until some gentle reader of these lines shall ask for them. Then we will bring them forth and persuade ourselves that we can detect a new increment of beauty added by the brief time since we last looked on them. I once heard an address on a librarian's duty to his successors. I will suggest a service not there mentioned to choose every year the best contemporary books that he can find worthily printed on time-proof papers, and have them bound in parchment, then let him place them on his shelves to gather gold from the touch of the mellowing years through the centuries to come and win him grateful memory, such as we bestow upon the unknown hands that wrought for these volumes the garments of the present in still increasing beauty. End of Parchment Bindings From the Book Lover and His Books by Harry Lyman Koopman Read by Alan Kelly. The Peace Movement by Helmut von Moltke From the German Classics, Volume 10 Translated by Edmund von Mark This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Forenote Professor Blunchley had sent the manual of the Institute of International Law to Count Moltke, and expressed the hope, in a letter dated November 19th, 1880, that it would meet with his approval. Count Moltke replied as follows. Forenote end. My dear Professor, you have been good enough to send me the manual published by the Institute of International Law, and you ask for my approval. In the first place, I fully recognise your humane endeavours to lessen the sufferings which war brings in its train. Eternal peace, however, is a dream and not even a beautiful dream. For war is part of God's scheme of the world. In war, the noblest virtues of man develop, courage and renunciation, the sense of duty and abnegation, and all at the risk of his life. Without war, the world would be swallowed up in the morass of materialism. With the principle stated in the preface, that the gradual advance of civilization should be reflected in the conduct of war, I fully agree. But I go further, and believe that civilization alone, and no codified laws of warfare 
can have the desired result. Every law necessitates an authority to watch over it and to direct its execution, but there is no power which can enforce obedience to international agreements. Which third state will take up arms because one or both of two powers at war with each other have broken the loi de la guerre? The human judge is lacking. In these matters we can hope for success only from the religious and moral education of the individuals and the honour and sense of right of the leaders, who make their own laws and act according to them, at least to the extent to which the abnormal conditions of war permit it. Nobody, I think, can deny the general softening of men's manners has been followed by a more humane way of waging war. Compare, if you will, the coarseness of the Thirty Years' War with the battles of recent dates. The introduction in our generation of universal service in the army has marked a long step in the direction of the desired aim, for it has brought also the educated classes into the army. Some rough and violent elements have survived, it is true, but the army no longer consists of them exclusively. The governments, moreover, have two means at hand to prevent the worst excesses, a strong discipline, practised and perfected in times of peace, and a commissariat equipped to provide for troops in the field. Without careful provision, discipline itself can only be moderately well enforced. The soldier who suffers pain and danger, fatigue and hunger, cannot merely en proportion avec les ressources du pays, but he must take whatever he needs. You must not ask of him superhuman things. The greatest blessing in war is its speedy termination, and to this end all means must be permitted which are not downright criminal. I cannot at all give my approval to the Déclaration de Saint-Pétersbourg that the weakening of the hostile army is the only justifiable procedure in war. On the contrary, all resources of the hostile government must be attacked, its finances, railways, provisions and even its prestige. The last war against France was waged in this way, and yet with greater moderation than any earlier war. The campaign was decided after two months, and the fierceness became characteristic of the fighting only when a revolutionary government continued the war through four more months, to the detriment of the country. I am glad to acknowledge that your manual, with its clear and short sentences, does greater justice than former attempts to what is needed in war, but even the acceptance of your regulations by the governments would not ensure their observance. It has long been a universally accepted rule of warfare that no messenger of peace should be shot at, but in the last campaign we frequently saw this done. No paragraph learned by heart will convince the soldier that the unorganised natives who spontaneamment, that is by their own free will, take up arms and threaten his life every moment of the day and night, should be recognised as lawful opponents. Certain requests of the manual, I fear, cannot be put into force. The identification, for instance, of the dead after a big battle. Others are subject to doubt, unless you insert Lorsque les circonstances les permettent, s'il se peut, si possible, s'il y a nécessité, or the like. This will give them that elasticity without which the bitter severity of actual warfare will break through all restrictions. In war, where everything must be treated individually, only those regulations will work well which are primarily addressed to the leaders. This includes everything that your manual has to say concerning the wounded and the sick, the physicians and their medicines. The general recognition of these principles, and also of those which have to do with the prisoners of war, would mark a notable step in advance and bring us nearer to the end which the Institute of International Law is pursuing with such admirable perseverance. Very respectfully, Count Moltke. End of the Peace Movement by Helmut von Moltke Read by Alistair President Jimmy Carter Inaugural Address, Thursday, January 20th, 1977 From U.S. Presidential Inaugural Addresses Assembled by James Linden This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maurice Donegan, Atlanta, Georgia, February 28, 2023. For myself and for our nation, I want to thank my predecessor for all that he has done to heal our land. In this outward and physical ceremony, we attest once again to the inner and spiritual strength of our nation. 
As my high school teacher, Miss Julia Coleman, used to say, we must adjust to changing times and still hold to unchanging principles. Here before me is the Bible used in the inauguration of our first president in 1789, and I have just taken the oath of office on the Bible my mother gave me just a few years ago, opened to a timeless admonition from the ancient prophet Micah. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. This inauguration ceremony marks a new beginning, a dedication within our government, and a new spirit among us all. A president may sense and proclaim that new spirit, but only a people can provide it. Two centuries ago, our nation's birth was a milestone in the long quest for freedom, but the bold and brilliant dream which excited the founders of this nation still awaits its consummation. I have no new dream to set forth today, but rather urge a fresh faith in the old dream. Ours was the first society openly to define itself in terms of both spirituality and human liberty. It is that unique self-definition which has given us an exceptional appeal, but also imposes upon us a special obligation to take on those moral duties which, when assumed, seemed invariably to be in our own best interest. You have given me a great responsibility to stay close to you, to be worthy of you, and to exemplify what you are. Let us create together a new national spirit of unity and trust. Your strength can compensate for my weakness, and your wisdom can help to minimize my mistakes. Let us learn together and laugh together and work together, and pray together, confident that in the end, we will triumph together in the right. The American dream endures. We must once again have full faith in our country and in one another. I believe America can be better. We can be even stronger than before. Let our recent mistakes bring a resurgent commitment to the basic principles of our nation, for we know that if we despise our own government, we have no future. We recall in special times when we have stood briefly but magnificently united. In those times, no prize was beyond our grasp but we cannot dwell upon remembered glory. We cannot afford to drift. We reject the prospect of failure or mediocrity or an inferior quality of life for any person. Our government must at the same time be both competent and compassionate. We have already found a high degree of personal liberty, and we are now struggling to enhance equality of opportunity. Our commitment to human rights must be absolute, our laws fair, our natural beauty preserved. The powerful must not persecute the weak, and human dignity must be enhanced. We have learned that more is not necessarily better, that even our great nation has its recognized limits, and that we can neither answer all questions nor solve all problems. We cannot afford to do everything, nor can we afford to lack boldness as we meet the future. So, together, in a spirit of individual sacrifice for the common good, we must simply do our best. Our nation can be strong abroad only if it is strong at home. And we know that the best way to enhance freedom in other lands, is to demonstrate here 
that our democratic system is worthy of emulation. To be true to ourselves, we must be true to others. We will not behave in foreign places so as to violate our rules and standards here at home, for we know that the trust which our nation earns is essential to our strength. The world itself is now dominated by a new spirit. Peoples more numerous and more politically aware are craving and now demanding their place in the sun, not just for the benefit of their own physical condition, but for basic human rights. The passion for freedom is on the rise. Tapping this new spirit, there can be no nobler nor more ambitious task for America to undertake on this day of a new beginning than to help shape a just and peaceful world that is truly humane. We are a strong nation, and we will maintain strength so sufficient that it need not be proven in combat, a quiet strength based not merely on the size of an arsenal, but on the nobility of ideas. We will be ever vigilant and never vulnerable, and we will fight our wars against poverty, ignorance, and injustice, for those are the enemies against which our forces can be honorably marshaled. We are a proudly idealistic nation, but let no one confuse our idealism with weakness. Because we are free, we can never be indifferent to the fate of freedom elsewhere. Our moral sense dictates a clear-cut preference for those societies which share with us an abiding respect for individual human rights. We do not seek to intimidate, but it is clear that a world which others can dominate with impunity would be inhospitable to decency and a threat to the well-being of all people. The world is still engaged in a massive armaments race designed to ensure continuing, equivalent strength among potential adversaries. We pledge perseverance and wisdom in our efforts to limit the world's armaments to those necessary for each nation's own domestic safety. And we will move this year a step toward our ultimate goal, the elimination of all nuclear weapons from this earth. We urge all other people to join us, for success can mean life instead of death. Within us, the people of the United States, there is evident a serious and purposeful rekindling of confidence. And I join in the hope that when my time as your president has ended, people might say this about our nation, that we remembered the words of Micah, and renewed our search for humility, mercy, and justice, that we have torn down the barriers that separate those of different race and region and religion, and where there had been mistrust, build unity with a respect for diversity, that we had found productive work for those able to perform it, that we had strengthened the American family, which is the basis of our society that we had ensured respect for the law and equal treatment under the law for the weak and the powerful and for the rich and the poor, and that we had enabled our people to be proud of their own government once again. I would hope that the nations of the world might say that we had built a lasting peace, built not on weapons of war, but on international policies which reflect our own most precious values. These are not just my goals, and they will not be my accomplishments, but the affirmation of our nation's continuing moral strength and our belief in an undiminished, ever-expanding American dream. Thank you very much. End of President Jimmy Carter Inaugural Address, Thursday, January 20th. 1977. President Ronald Reagan First Inaugural Address, Tuesday, January 20, 1981. From 
U.S. Presidential Inaugural Addresses, assembled by James Linden. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maurice Donegan, Atlanta, Georgia, March 20, 2023. Senator Hatfield, Mr. Chief Justice, Mr. President, Vice President Bush, Vice President Mondale, Senator Baker, Speaker O'Neill, Reverend Muma, and my fellow citizens. To a few of us here today, this is a solemn and most momentous occasion, and yet, in the history of our nation, it is a commonplace occurrence. The orderly transfer of authority as called for in the Constitution routinely takes place as it has for almost two centuries, and few of us stop to think of how unique we really are. In the eyes of many in the world, this every four-year ceremony we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. Mr. President, I want our fellow citizens to know how much you did to carry on this tradition. By your gracious cooperation in the transition process, you have shown a watching world that we are a united people, pledged to maintaining a political system which guarantees individual liberty to a greater degree than any other, and I thank you and your people for all the help in maintaining the continuity which is the bulwark of our republic. The business of our nation goes forward. These United States are confronted with an economic affliction of great proportions. We suffer from the longest and one of the worst sustained inflations in our national history. It distorts our economic decisions, penalizes thrift, and crushes the struggling young and the fixed-income elderly alike. It threatens to shatter the lives of millions of our people. Idle industries have cast workers into unemployment, human misery, and personal indignity. Those who do work are denied a fair return for their labor by a tax system which penalizes successful achievement and keeps us from maintaining full productivity. But great as our tax burden is, it has not kept pace with public spending. For decades, we have piled deficit upon deficit, mortgaging our future and our children's future for the temporary convenience of the present. To continue this long trend is to guarantee tremendous social, cultural, political, and economic upheavals. You and I, as individuals, can, by borrowing, live beyond our means, but only for a limited period of time. Why, then, should we think that collectively, as a nation, we are not bound by that same limitation? We must act today in order to preserve tomorrow. And let there be no misunderstanding. We are going to begin to act, beginning today. The economic ills we suffer have come upon us over several decades. They will not go away in days, weeks, or months, but they will go away. They will go away because we, as Americans, have the capacity now, as we have had in the past, to do whatever needs to be done to preserve this last and greatest bastion of freedom. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. From time to time, we have been tempted to believe that society has become too complex to be managed by self-rule, that government by an elite group is superior to government for, by, and of the people. But if no one among us is capable of governing himself, then who among us has the capacity to govern someone else? All of us together, in and out of government, must bear the burden. The solutions we seek must be equitable with no one group singled out to pay a higher price. We hear much of special interest groups. Our concern must be for a special interest group that has been too long neglected. It knows no sectional boundaries or ethnic or racial divisions, and it crosses political party lines. It is made up of men and women who raise our food, patrol our streets, man our mines and factories, teach our children, keep our homes, and heal us when we are sick. Professionals, industrialists, shopkeepers, clerks, cabbies, and truck drivers. 
They are, in short, we the people, this breed called Americans. This administration's objective will be a healthy, vigorous, growing economy that provides equal opportunity for all Americans with no barriers born of bigotry or discrimination. Putting America back to work means putting all Americans back to work. Ending inflation means freeing all Americans from the terror of runaway living costs. All must share in the productive work of this new beginning, and all must share in the bounty of a revived economy. With the idealism and fair play, which are the core of our system and our strength, we can have a strong and prosperous America at peace with itself and the world. So, as we begin, let us take inventory. We are a nation that has a government, not the other way around. And this makes us special among the nations of the earth. Our government has no power except that granted to it by the people. It is time to check and reverse the growth of government, which shows signs of having grown beyond the consent of the governed. It is my intention to curb the size and influence of the federal establishment and to demand recognition of the distinction between the powers granted to the federal government and those reserved to the states or to the people. All of us need to be reminded that the federal government did not create the states, the states created the federal government. Now, so there will be no misunderstanding, it is not my intention to do away with government. It is, rather, to make it work, work with us, not over us, to stand by our side, not ride on our back. Government can and must provide opportunity, not smother it, foster productivity, not stifle it. If we look to the answer as to why, for so many years, we achieved so much, prospered as no other people on earth, it was because here, in this land, we unleashed the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever been done before. Freedom and the dignity of individual have become more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. It is no coincidence that our present troubles parallel and are proportionate to the intervention and intrusion in our lives that result from unnecessary and excessive growth of government. It is time for us to realize that we are too great a nation to limit ourselves to small dreams. We are not, as some would have us believe, doomed to inevitable decline. I do not believe in a fate that will fall on us no matter what we do. I do believe in a fate that will fall on us if we do nothing. So, with all the creative energy at our command, let us begin an era of national renewal. Let us renew our determination, our courage, and our strength, and let us renew our faith and our hope. We have every right to dream heroic dreams. Those who say that we are in a time when there are no heroes, they just don't know where to look. You can see heroes every day going in and out of factory gates. Others, a handful in numbers, produce enough food to feed us all and then the world beyond. You meet heroes across a counter, and they are on both sides of that counter. There are entrepreneurs with faith in themselves and faith in an idea who create new jobs, new wealth, and opportunity. They are individuals and families whose taxes support the government and whose voluntary gifts support church, charity, culture, art, and education. Their patriotism is quiet but deep. Their values sustain our national life. Now I have used the words they and their in speaking of these heroes. I could say you and your because I am addressing the heroes of whom I speak. You, the citizens of this blessed land. Your dreams, your hopes, your goals are going to be the dreams, the hopes, and the goals of this administration. So help me God. We shall reflect the compassion that is so much a part of your makeup. How can we love our country and not love our countrymen 
and loving them, reach out a hand when they fall, heal them when they are sick, and provide opportunities to make them self-sufficient so they will be equal in fact, not just in theory. Can we solve the problems confronting us? Well, the answer is an unequivocal and emphatic yes. To paraphrase Winston Churchill, I did not take the oath I have just taken with the intention of presiding over the dissolution of the world's strongest economy. In the days ahead, I will propose removing the roadblocks that have slowed our economy and reduced productivity. Steps will be taken aimed at restoring the balance between the various levels of government. Progress may be slow, measured in inches and feet, not miles, but we will progress. It is time to reawaken this industrial giant, to get government back within its means, and to lighten our punitive tax burden. And these will be our first priorities, and on these principles there will be no compromise. On the eve of our struggle for independence, a man who might have been one of the greatest among the founding fathers, Dr. Joseph Warren, President of the Massachusetts Congress, said to his fellow Americans, Our country is in danger, but not to be despaired of. On you depend the fortunes of America. You are to decide the important question upon which rests the happiness and the liberty of millions yet unborn. Act worthy of yourselves. Well, I believe we, the Americans of today, are ready to act worthy of ourselves, ready to do what must be done to ensure happiness and liberty for ourselves, our children, and our children's children. As we renew ourselves here in our own land, we will be seen as having greater strength throughout the world. We will again be the exemplar of freedom and a beacon of hope for those who do not now have freedom. To those neighbors and allies who share our freedom, we will strengthen our historic ties and assure them of our support and firm commitment. We will match loyalty with loyalty. We will strive for mutually beneficial relations. We will not use our friendship to impose upon their sovereignty, for our own sovereignty is not for sale. As for the enemies of freedom, those who are potential adversaries, they will be reminded that peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. We will negotiate for it, sacrifice for it, we will not surrender for it, now or ever. Our forbearance should never be misunderstood. Our reluctance for conflict should not be misjudged as a failure of will. When action is required to preserve our national security, we will act. We will maintain sufficient strength to prevail, if need be, knowing that if we do so, we have the best chance of never having to use that strength. Above all, we must realize that no arsenal or no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. It is a weapon our adversaries in today's world do not have. It is a weapon that we as Americans do have. Let that be understood by those who practice terrorism and prey upon their neighbors. I am told that tens of thousands of prayer meetings are being held on this day, and for that I am deeply grateful. We are a nation under God, and I believe God intended for us to be free. It would be fitting and good, I think, if on each inauguration day in future years it should be declared a day of prayer. This is the first time in our history that this ceremony has been held, as you have been told, on the west front of the Capitol. Standing here, one faces a magnificent vista opening up on this city's special beauty in history. At one end of this open mall are those shrines to the giants on whose shoulders we stand. Directly in front of me, the monument to a monumental man, George Washington, father of our country. A man of humility who came to greatness reluctantly. He led America out of revolutionary victory into infant nationhood. 
Off to one side, the stately memorial to Thomas Jefferson. The Declaration of Independence flames with his eloquence. And then, beyond the reflecting pool, the dignified columns of the Lincoln Memorial. Whoever would understand in his heart the meaning of America will find it in the life of Abraham Lincoln. Beyond those monuments to heroism is the Potomac River, and on the far shore, the sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery, with its row upon row of simple white markers bearing crosses or stars of David. They add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. Each one of those markers is a monument to the kinds of hero I spoke of earlier. Their lives ended in places called Bella Woods, the Argonne, Omaha Beach, Salerno, and halfway around the world on Guadalcanal, Tarara, Pork Chop Hill, the Chosen Reservoir, and in hundreds of rice paddies and jungles of a place called Vietnam. Under one such marker, lies a young man, Martin Treptow, who left his job in a small town barber shop in 1917 to go to France with the famed Rainbow Division. There, on the Western Front, he was killed, trying to carry a message between battalions under heavy artillery fire. We are told that on his body was found a diary. On the flyleaf under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words. America must win this war. Therefore, I will work. I will save. I will sacrifice. I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost. As if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. The crisis we are facing today does not require of us the kind of sacrifice that Martin Treptow and so many thousands of others were called upon to make. It does require, however, our best effort and our willingness to believe in ourselves and to believe in our capacity to perform great deeds, to believe that together, with God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And, after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans. God bless you and thank you. End of President Ronald Reagan's first inaugural address, Tuesday, January 20th, 1981. President Ronald Reagan's second inaugural address, Monday, January 21, 1985, from U.S. Presidential Inaugural Addresses, assembled by James Linden. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maurice Stonigan, Atlanta, Georgia, March 27, 2023. Senator Mathias, Chief Justice Berger, Vice President Bush, Speaker O'Neill, Senator Dole, Reverend Clergy, members of my family and friends, and my fellow citizens. This day has been made brighter with the presence of one who, for a time, had been absent, Senator John Stennis. God bless you and welcome back. There is, however, one who is not with us today. Representative Gillis Long of Louisiana left us last night. I wonder if we could all join in in a moment of silent prayer. Amen. There are no words adequate to express my thanks for the great honor that you bestowed upon me. I will do my utmost to be deserving of your trust. This is, as Senator Matthias told us, the fiftieth time that we, the people, have celebrated this historic occasion. When the first president, George Washington, placed his hand upon the Bible, he stood less than a single day journey by horseback, from raw, untamed wilderness. There were four million Americans in a union of thirteen states. Today there are sixty times as many 
in a union of fifty states. We have lighted the world with our inventions, gone to the aid of mankind, wherever in the world there was a cry for help, journeyed to the moon, and safely returned. So much has changed, and yet we stand together as we did two centuries ago. When I took this oath four years ago, I did so in a time of economic stress. Voices were raised saying that we had to look to our past for the greatness and the glory. But we, the present-day Americans, are not given to looking backward. In this blessed land, there is always a better tomorrow. Four years ago, I spoke to you of a new beginning, and we have accomplished that. But in another sense, our new beginning is a continuation of that beginning created two centuries ago, when for the first time in history, government, the people said, was not our master, it is our servant. It's only power, that which we the people allow it to have. That system has never failed us, but for a time, we failed the system. We asked things of government that government was not equipped to give. We yielded authority to the national government that properly belonged to the states or to local governments or to the people themselves. We allowed taxes and inflation to rob us of our earnings and savings and watched the great industrial machine that had made us the most productive people on earth slow down and the number of unemployed increase. By 1980, we knew it was time to renew our faith to strive with all of our strength towards the ultimate in individual freedom consistent with an orderly society. We believe then, and now, that there are no limits to growth and human progress when men and women are free to follow their dreams. And we were right. And we were right to believe that. Tax rates have been reduced. Inflation cut dramatically, and more people are employed than ever before in our history. We are creating a nation, once again, vibrant, robust, and alive. But there are many mountains yet to climb. We will not rest until every American enjoys the fullness of freedom, dignity, and opportunity as our birthright. It is our birthright as citizens of this great republic and we'll meet this challenge. These will be the years when Americans have restored their confidence and tradition of progress, when our values of faith, family, work, and neighborhood were restated for a modern age, when our economy was finally freed from government grip, when we made a sincere effort at meaningful arms reduction, rebuilding our defenses, our economy, and developing new technologies, and helped preserve peace in a troubled world. When Americans courageously supported the struggle for liberty, self-government, and free enterprise throughout the world, and turned the tide of history away from totalitarian darkness and into the warm sunlight of human freedom. My fellow citizens, our nation is poised for greatness. We must do what we know is right, and do it with all of our might. Let history say of us, these were golden years, when the American Revolution was reborn when freedom gained new life, when America reached for her best. Our two-party system has served us well over the years, but never better than in those times of great challenge when we came together, not as Democrats or Republicans, but as Americans, united in a common cause. Two of our founding fathers, a Boston lawyer named Adams and a Virginia planter named Jefferson, members of that remarkable group, who met in Independence Hall and dared to think they could start the world over again, left us an important lesson. They had become political rivals in the presidential election of 1800. Then, years later, when both were retired and age had softened their anger, they began to speak to each other again through letters. A bond was reestablished between those two who had helped to create this government of ours. In 1826, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, they both died. They died on the same day within a few hours of each other, and that day was the 4th of July. In one of those letters exchanged in the sunset of their lives, Jefferson wrote, It carries me back to the times when, beset with difficulties and dangers, we were fellow laborers in the same cause, struggling for what is the most valuable to man, 
his right to self-government. Laboring always at the same war, with some wave ever ahead threatening to overwhelm us, and yet passing harmless, we rode through the storm with heart and hand. Well, with heart and hand, let us stand as one today. One people under God determined that our future shall be worthy of our past. As we do, we must not repeat the well-intentioned errors of our past. We must never again abuse the trust of working men and women by sending their earnings on a futile chase after the spiraling demands of a bloated federal establishment. You elected us in 1980 to end this prescription for disaster, and I don't believe you re-elected us in 1984 to reverse course. At the heart of our efforts is one idea, vindicated by 25 straight months of economic growth, freedom and incentives, unleash the drive and entrepreneurial genius that are at the core of human progress. We have begun to increase the rewards for work, savings, and investment, reduce the increase in the cost and size of government and its interference in people's lives. We must simplify our tax system, make it more fair, and bring the rates down for all who work and earn. We must think anew and move with new boldness so every American who seeks work can find work, so the least among us shall have an equal chance to achieve the greatest things, to be heroes who heal our sick, feed the hungry, protect peace among nations, and leave this world a better place. The time has come for a new American emancipation, a great national drive to tear down economic barriers and liberate the spirit of enterprise in the most distressed areas of our country. My friends, together we can do this, and do it we must. So help me God. From new freedom will spring new opportunities for growth, a more productive, fulfilled, and united people, and a stronger America, an America that will lead the technological revolution and also open its mind and heart and soul to the treasures of literature, music, and poetry, and the values of faith, courage, and love. A dynamic economy with more citizens working and paying taxes will be our strongest tool to bring down the budget deficits. But an almost unbroken 50 years of deficit spending has finally brought us to a time of reckoning. We have come to a turning point, a moment for hard decisions. I have asked the cabinet and my staff a question, and now I put the same question to all of you. If not us, who? And if not now, when? It must be done by all of us going forward with a program aimed at reaching a balanced budget. We can begin reducing the national debt. I will shortly submit a budget to Congress aimed at freezing the government program spending for the next year. Beyond that, we must take further steps to permanently control government's power to tax and spend. We must act now to protect future generations from government's desire to spend its citizens' money and tax them into servitude when the bills come due. Let us make it unconstitutional for the federal government to spend more than the federal government takes in. We have already started returning to the people and to the state and local governments responsibilities better handled by them. Now, there is a place for the federal government in matters of social compassion, but our fundamental goals must be to reduce dependency and upgrade the dignity of those who are infirmed or disadvantaged. And here, a growing economy and support from family and community offer our best chance for a society where compassion is a way of life, where the old and infirmed are cared for, the young and, yes, the unborn protected, and the unfortunate looked after and made self-sufficient. And there is another area where the federal government can play a part. As an older American, I remember a time when people of a different race, creed, or ethnic origin in our land found hatred and prejudice installed in social custom and, yes, in law. There is no story more heartening in our history than the progress that we have made towards the brotherhood of man that God intended for us. Let us resolve 
that there will be no turning back or hesitation on the road to an America rich in dignity and abundant with opportunity for all of our citizens. Let us resolve that we, the people, will build an American Opportunity Society in which all of us, white and black, rich and poor, young and old, will go forward together, arm in arm. Again, let us remember that though our heritage is one of bloodlines from every corner of the earth, we are all Americans pledged to carry on this last best hope of man on earth. I have spoken of our domestic goals and the limitations which we should not put on the national government. Now let me turn to a task which is primarily the responsible of the national government, the safety and security of our people. Today we utter no prayer more fervently than the ancient prayer for peace on earth. Yet history has shown that peace will not come, nor will our freedom be preserved by goodwill alone. There are those in the world who scorn our vision of human dignity and freedom. One nation, the Soviet Union, has conducted the greatest military buildup in the history of man, building arsenals of awesome offensive weapons. We have made progress in restoring our defense capability, but much remains to be done. There must be no wavering by us, nor any doubts by others, that America will meet her responsibilities to remain free, secure, and at peace. There is only one way safely and legitimately to reduce the costs of national security, and that is to reduce the need for it. And this we are trying to do in negotiations with the Soviet Union. We are not just discussing limits on further increase of nuclear weapons. We seek instead to reduce their number. We seek the total elimination, one day, of nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. Now, for decades, we and the Soviets have lived under the threat of mutual assured destruction. If either resorted to the use of nuclear weapons, the other could retaliate and destroy the one who had started it. Is there either logic or morality in believing that if one side threatens to kill tens of millions of our people, our only recourse is to threaten killing tens of millions of theirs? I have approved a research program to find, if we can, a security shield that would destroy nuclear missiles before they could reach their target. It wouldn't kill people, it would destroy weapons. It wouldn't militarize space. It would help to militarize the arsenals of the Earth. It would render nuclear weapons obsolete. We will meet with the Soviets, hoping that we can agree on a way to rid the world of the threat of nuclear destruction. We strive for peace and security, heartened by the challenges all around us. Since the turn of the century, the number of democracies in the world has grown fourfold. Human freedom is on the march, and nowhere more so than our own hemisphere. Freedom is one of the deepest and noblest aspirations of the human spirit. People worldwide hunger for the right of self-determination, for those inalienable rights that make for human dignity and progress. America must remain freedom's staunchest friend, for freedom is our best ally. And it is the world's only hope to conquer poverty and preserve peace. Every blow we inflict against poverty will be a blow against its dark allies of oppression and war. Every victory for human freedom will be a victory for world peace. So we go forward today, a nation still mighty in its youth and powerful in its purpose. With our alliances strengthened, with our economy leading the world to a new age of economic expansion, we look forward to a world rich in possibilities. And all of this because we have worked and acted together, not as members of political parties, but as Americans. My friends, we live in a world that is lit by lightning. So much is changing and will change, but so much endures and transcends time. History is a ribbon, always unfurling. History is a journey. And as we continue our journey, we think of those who traveled before us. 
We stand together at the steps of this symbol of our democracy, or we would have been standing at the steps if it hadn't gotten so cold. Now we are standing inside the symbol of our democracy. Now we hear again the echoes of our past. A general falls to his knees in the hard snow of Valley Forge. A lonely president paces the darkened halls and ponders his struggle to preserve the Union. The men of the Alamo call out encouragement to each other. A settler pushes west and sings a song, and the song echoes out forever and fills the unknowing air. It is the American sound. It is hopeful, big-hearted, idealistic, daring, decent, and fair. That's our heritage. That is our song. We sing it still. For all of our problems, our differences, we are together as of old, as we raise our voices to the God who is the author of the most tender music. And may he continue to hold us close as we fill the world with our sound, sound in unity, affection, and love. One people under God, dedicated to the dream of freedom that he has placed in the human heart, called upon now to pass that dream on to a waiting and hopeful world. God bless you, and may God bless America. End of President Ronald Reagan's Second Inaugural Address Monday, January 21, 1985The Rosetta Stone, excerpt by Sir E. A. Wallace Budge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hawaii in March 2023. The Rosetta Stone The Discovery of the Stone the famous slab of black basalt which stands at the southern end of the egyptian gallery in the british museum and which has for more than a century been universally known as the rosetta stone was found at a spot near the mouth of the great arm of the nile that flows through the western delta to the sea not far from the town of rashid or as europeans call it rosetta according to one account it was found lying on the ground and according to another it was built into a very old wall, which a company of French soldiers had been ordered to remove in order to make way for the foundations of an addition to the fort, afterwards known as Fort St. Julian. The actual finder of the stone was a French officer of engineers, whose name is sometimes spelt Boussard and sometimes Bouchard, who subsequently rose to the rank of general and was alive in 1814. He made his great discovery in August 1799. Finding that there were on one side of the stone lines of strange characters, which it was thought might be writing, as well as long lines of Greek letters, Boussard reported his discovery to General Menou, who ordered him to bring the stone to his house in Alexandria. This was immediately done, and the stone was, for about two years, regarded as the general's private property. When Napoleon heard of the stone, he ordered it to be taken to Cairo and placed in the Institut National, which he had recently founded in that city. On its arrival in Cairo, it became at once an object of the deepest interest to the body of learned men whom Napoleon had taken with him on his expedition to Egypt, and the emperor himself exhibited the greatest curiosity in respect of the contents of the inscriptions cut upon it. He at once ordered a number of copies of the stone to be made for distribution among the scholars of Europe, and two skilled lithographers, citizens Marcel and Galland, were specially brought to Cairo from Paris to make them. The plan which they followed was to cover the surface of the stone with printer's ink, and then to lay upon it a sheet of paper which they rolled with India rubber rollers until a good impression had been taken. Several of these ink impressions were sent to scholars of great repute in many parts of Europe, and in the autumn of 1801 General Dagua took two to Paris, where he committed them to the care of Citizen du Tey of the Institut National of Paris. 
the arrival of the stone in England. After the successful operations of Sir Ralph Abercrombie in Egypt in the spring of 1801, a treaty of capitulation was drawn up, and by Article 16, the Rosetta Stone and several other large and important Egyptian antiquities were surrendered to General Hutchinson at the end of August in that year. Some of these he dispatched at once to England in HMS Admiral and others in HMS Madras, but the Rosetta Stone did not leave Egypt until later in the year. After the ink impressions had been taken from it, the stone was transferred from Cairo to General Menou's house in Alexandria, where it was kept covered with cloth and under a double matting. In September 1801, Major General Turner claimed the stone by virtue of the treaty mentioned above, but as it was generally regarded as the French general's private property, the surrender of it was accompanied by some difficulty. In the following month, Major General Turner obtained possession of the stone and embarked with it on HMS L'Egyptienne and arrived at Portsmouth in February 1802. On March 11, it was deposited at the rooms of the Society of Antiquaries of London, where it remained for a few months, and the writings upon it were submitted to a very careful examination by many Oriental and Greek scholars. In July, the president of the society caused four plaster casts of the stone to be made for the universities of Oxford, Cambridge, Edinburgh, and Dublin, and had good copies of the Greek text engraved and dispatched to all the great universities, libraries, academies, and societies in Europe. Towards the close of the year, the stone was removed from the rooms of the Society of Antiquaries to the British Museum, where it was mounted and at once exhibited to the general public. Description of the Stone The Rosetta Stone in its present state is an irregularly shaped slab of compact black basalt, which measures about 3 feet 9 inches in length, 2 feet 4 and a half inches in width, and 11 inches in thickness. The top right and left hand corners and the right hand bottom corner are wanting. It is not possible to say how much of the stone is missing, but judging by the proportion which exists between the lengths of the inscriptions that are now upon it, we may assume that when it was complete, it was at least 12 inches longer than it is now. The upper end of the stone was probably rounded, and, if we may judge from the reliefs found on stele of this class of the Ptolemaic period, the front of the rounded part was sculptured with a figure of the winged disc of Horus of Edfu, having pendant Uriae, one wearing the crown of the south and the other the crown of the north. Below the winged disc there may have been a relief in which the king was seen standing, with his queen, in the presence of a series of gods similar to that found on one of the copies mentioned below of the inscriptions on the Rosetta stone. Whatever the sculptured decoration may have been, it is tolerably certain that, when the stone was in a complete state, it must have been between five and six feet in height, and that when mounted upon a suitable plinth and set up near the statue of the king in whose honour it was engraved, it formed a prominent monument in the temple in which it was set up. The inscription on the Rosetta stone is written in two languages, that is to say, in Egyptian and in Greek. The Egyptian portion of it is cut upon it in 1, the hieroglyphic character, that is to say, in the old picture writing, which was employed from the earliest dynasties in making copies of the Book of the Dead, and in nearly all state and ceremonial documents that were intended to be seen by the public, and 2, the demotic character, that is to say, the conventional, abbreviated and modified form of the hieratic character, or cursive form of hieroglyphic writing, which was in use in the Ptolemaic period. The Greek portion of the inscription is cut in ordinary unseals. The hieroglyphic text consists of 14 lines only, and these correspond to the last 28 lines of the Greek text. The demotic text consists of 32 lines, the first 14 being imperfect at the beginnings, and the Greek text consists of 54 lines, the last 26 being imperfect at the ends. 
a large portion of the missing lines of the hieroglyphic text can be restored from a steel discovered in 1898 at Tamanhua in the Delta, Hermopolis Parva, and now in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, and from a copy of the text of the decree cut on the walls of a temple at Philae, and the correctness of the restorations of broken passages in the Demotic and Greek texts being evident, we are justified in assuming that we have the inscription of the Rosetta Stone complete, both in Egyptian and Greek. The Earliest Decipherers of the Rosetta Stone The first translation of the Greek text was made by the Reverend Stephen Weston, and was read by him before the Society of Antiquaries of London in April 1802. This was quickly followed by a French translation made by Citizen du Tey, who declared that the stone was a monument of the gratitude of some priests of Alexandria, or some neighbouring place, towards Ptolemy Epiphanes. And a Latin translation by Citizen Amelhon appeared in Paris in the spring of 1803. The first studies of the Demotic text were those of Silvestre de Sassy and Ackerblatt in 1802, and the latter succeeded in making out the general meaning of portions of the opening lines and in identifying the equivalents of the names of Alexander, Alexandria, Ptolemy, Isis, etc. Both de Sassy and Ackerblatt began their labours by attacking the Demotic equivalents of the cartouches, that is, the ovals containing royal names in the hieroglyphic text. In 1818, Dr. Thomas Young compiled for the fourth volume of the Encyclopaedia Britannica, published in 1819, the results of his studies of the texts on the Rosetta Stone, and among them was a list of several alphabetic Egyptian characters to which, in most cases, he had assigned correct values. He was the first to grasp the idea of a phonetic principle in the reading of the Egyptian hieroglyphs, and he was the first to apply it to their decipherment. Warburton, De Guin, Barthélemy, and Zoega all suspected the existence of alphabetic hieroglyphics, and the three last-named scholars believed that the oval, or cartouche, contained a proper or royal name. But it was Young who first proved both points, and successfully deciphered the name of Ptolemy on the Rosetta Stone, and that of Berenice on another monument. Another successful decipherer at this time was Mr. J. W. Banks, who, in 1818, deciphered the name of Cleopatra on the granite obelisk that he had excavated at Philae in 1815. In 1822, the list of alphabetic Egyptian characters that had been drawn up by Young was corrected and greatly enlarged by J. F. Champollion, who, between that date and the year of his death, correctly deciphered the hieroglyphic forms of the names and titles of most of the Roman emperors, and drew up a classified list of Egyptian hieroglyphs, and formulated a system of grammar and general decipherment, which is the foundation whereon all later Egyptologists have worked. The discovery of the correct alphabetic values of Egyptian signs was most useful for reading names, but for translating the Egyptian language a competent knowledge of Coptic was required. Now Coptic is only a name meaning Egyptian. The Egyptians who embraced Christianity after the preaching of St. Mark at Alexandria are called Copts, and the translations of the Holy Scriptures, liturgies, etc., which they made from Greek into their native Egyptian language soon after their conversion to Christianity, are said to be written in Coptic. The knowledge of Coptic has never been lost, and a comparatively large sacred literature has always been available in manuscripts for study by scholars. Champollion, whilst still a youth in the early years of the 19th century, realized the great importance of Coptic for the purpose of Egyptian decipherment, and he studied it to such good purpose that he became an authority on the language and literature of the Copts. In his studies of the inscription on the Rosetta Stone, his knowledge of Coptic enabled him to deduce the phonetic values of many syllabic signs, and to assign correct readings to many pictorial characters, the meanings of which were made known to him by the Greek text on the stone.
the contents of the inscription on the rosetta stone the inscription on the rosetta stone is a copy of the decree passed by the general council of egyptian priests assembled at memphis to celebrate the first commemoration of the coronation of ptolemy v epiphanes king of all egypt the young king had been crowned in the eighth year of his reign therefore the first commemoration took place in the ninth year in the spring of the year b c one hundred ninety six the original form of the decree is given by the demotic section and the hieroglyphic and greek versions were made from it the inscription is dated on the fourth day of the greek month zandikos april corresponding to the eighteenth day of the egyptian month meshir or mekhir of the ninth year of the reign of ptolemy v epiphanes the year in which aetus the son of aetus was chief priest and pyrrha the daughter of philinus and Araya, the daughter of diogenes and irene the daughter of ptolemy were chief priestesses the opening lines are filled with a list of the titles of ptolemy v and a series of epithets which proclaim the king's piety towards the gods and his love for the egyptians and his country in the second section of the inscription the priests enumerate the benefits which he had conferred upon egypt and which may be thus summarized one gifts of money and corn to the temples two gifts of endowments to temples three remission of one half of taxes due to the government four abolition of one half of the taxes five forgiveness of debts owed by the people to the government six release of the prisoners who had been languishing in jail for years seven abolition of the press gang for sailors eight reduction of fees payable by candidates for the priesthood nine reduction of the dues payable by the temples to the government ten restoration of the services in the temples eleven forgiveness of rebels who were permitted to return to egypt and live there twelve dispatch of troops by sea and land against the enemies of egypt thirteen the siege and conquest of the town of shechem lycopolis fourteen forgiveness of the debts owed by the priests to him fifteen reduction of the tax on bissus sixteen reduction of the tax on corn lands seventeen restoration of the temples of the apis and nevis bulls and of the other sacred animals eighteen rebuilding of ruined shrines and sacred buildings and providing them with endowments as a mark of the gratitude of the priesthood to the king for all these gracious acts of ptolemy v it was decided by the general council of the priests of egypt to increase the ceremonial observances of honour which are paid to ptolemy the ever-living in the temples with this object in view it was decided one to make statues of ptolemy in his character of saviour of egypt and to set up one in every temple of egypt for the priests and people to worship two to make figures of ptolemy in gold and to place them in gold shrines which are to be set side by side with the shrines of the gods and carried about in procession with them three to distinguish the shrine of ptolemy by means of ten double crowns of gold which are to be placed upon it four to make the anniversaries of the birthday and coronation days of ptolemy that is the seventeenth and thirtieth days of the month mesore festival days forever five to make the first five days of the month of thoth days of festival forever offerings shall be made in the temples and all the people shall wear garlands six to add a new title to the titles of the priests that is priests of the beneficent god ptolemy epiphanes who appeareth on earth which is to be cut upon the ring of every priest of ptolemy and inserted in every priestly document seven 
that the soldiers may borrow the shrines with figures of Ptolemy inside them from the temples, and may take them to their quarters and carry them about in procession. 8. That copies of this decree shall be cut upon slabs of basalt in the writing of the speech of the god, that is, hieroglyphs, and in the writing of the books, that is, demotic, and in the writing of the Uayenin, that is, Greek. And a basalt slab on which a copy of this decree is cut shall be set up in the temples of the first, second, and third orders, side by side with the statue of Ptolemy, the ever-living god. E. A. Wallace Budge, Department of Egyptian and Assyrian Antiquities, July 12, 1913. End of The Rosetta Stone, an excerpt by E. A. Wallace Budge. Trade in the Dead by H. Ryder Haggard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elsie Selwyn. Trade in the Dead, the Desecration of It. Mr. Ryder Haggard writes in the London Daily Mail of July 22nd. Compared with that which I remember at Bullock many years ago, the new Museum of Antiquities at Cairo is indeed a magnificent building. Within its lofty walls are collected the relics of some 5,000 years of the ancient history of Egypt, of the rule, indeed, of no fewer than 297 kings and Caesars, say, from Mena, who flourished about 4,400 BC, to the Roman Decius, who reigned about 250 AD. To study all these properly takes many days, to describe them would occupy volumes. No, I confine myself to the royal mummies, not from a wish to be gruesome, but because concerning them I desire to make some suggestions. There they lie, very many of them, some stripped, others still in their ancient wrappings, Ramses and Seti, the generations of the family of Thotmes, and the rest, kings, queens, princes, and little children, once famous in this land, every one of them. Is it right? There, stripped of their royal ornaments and state, they repose in their glass cases for the visitor to stare at. There, for instance, is Meneftah, whose heart was hardened, so that he withstood Moses, that pharaoh, it is believed, who saw the firstborn die and heard the march of the departing Israelites. But he did not perish in the Red Sea, when, of all the host of Pharaoh, there remained not so much as one of them. No, for we may still look upon his body with his name scribbled on its yellow wrappings, as I did the other day. It has never been unrolled, and one wonders whether within it is hidden any key to those great events recorded in the book of Exodus, as to which Egyptian history is so strangely silent. Among these mummies, Seti is beautiful to look on, black but comely, with his smile and placid brow of pride, and there is much majesty in the withered countenance of that mighty monarch, the aged Ramses, his son. But what of the rest? To be frank, all are repulsive, and some are horrible to see. Is it right, then, that kings and queens and high priests and priestesses, prophets and prophetesses of God as they understood him, should be thus dragged from the sepulchres they fashioned with so much thought and care, and for so high a purpose, stripped, too, even of their shrouds, and made a show of in the very land they ruled? Should not we English shudder if some seer told us that within a given number of years, say, three thousand, which to the dead for whom time does not exist, whatever we believe, can be but as a moment's sleep? Those who rest in Westminster Abbey were destined to be treated in just this fashion, to satisfy the curiosity of men unborn? I think so, yet where these Egyptian departed are concerned, we hear no voice of public protest. Why were they thus preserved? Because above all people that ever lived, the old Egyptians believed in the resurrection of the body, and conceived foolishly enough, perhaps, that on this account the body itself must be held back from corruption in order that, at the time appointed, it might once more receive the spirit. 
Therefore they built themselves everlasting houses, and lavished their wealth upon their burials, and believed that no crime was more heinous than to disturb the dead. Yet we, who are Christians and share the cardinal doctrines of their faith, treat them thus. A plea for restoration. Everywhere in Egypt it is the same. At Luxor the other day I saw the naked body of a little child lying in a wooden box outside a shop, to be purchased for a few piastres. Within was the corpse of a priestess in her painted coffin. For a penny, the Arab would lift the lid and show her with a ghoulish laugh. At Ben Hassan, the deep tombs are being violated by the score, and those who have slept within them for four thousand years or so dragged forth. We saw them lying in some of the larger sepulchres, adults and children together, saw also many long deal boxes being nailed up. To guess their contents was not difficult and so forth. Within another score of years, scarcely a grave in Egypt that can be discovered will be left unrifled. I suggest, therefore, that these excesses should be modified, and more particularly, that the royal bodies should be restored to their sepulchres. What are the arguments against such a course? That robbers would get at them and break them up? This can be prevented by proper iron gates. Also, when it is known that no object of value remains, Human flesh and bone have no great worth in the eyes of thieves. That the museum would lose an attraction and the curiosity of visitors be balked. Though these distorted, withered corpses are not, in fact, agreeable, much to the contrary, indeed, this objection, such as it is, could to a great extent be overcome by modeling each body of importance carefully in wax and exhibiting the reproduction, which it would be difficult to distinguish from the original. That science would suffer. Why? The mummies can first be unrolled, photographed, measured, weighed, rotten getting rayed, etc. After that, what more has science to learn from them? that there are various difficulties in the way of restoring these princes to their tombs. I do not agree, but if no, then place them all in the central chamber of the Great Pyramid, which is a cavity of no great interest, and pump it full of cement so that it may remain inviolate forever. I venture to hope that this plea for the dead will not be dismissed as a mere sentiment. At least it is a sentiment that is shared by many people, and among them, as I am aware, by some people who are in the best position to know about the matter in all its bearings. A Cargo of Kings Lastly, if something is not done, the question will set itself ultimately in another fashion. I quote from the new guide to the Cairo Museum. It says, page 412, speaking of the royal mummies found at Dir el Bahari, which were unwrapped in 1886, Every precaution was taken to ensure their preservation, but notwithstanding all this, they have been seriously damaged since they were found, and in spite of all the care that has been taken to surround them with substances likely to preserve them, most of them have been attacked by insects. Some day they will disappear altogether. I may add that after a period of seventeen years, it seems to me that those mummies which I saw first, but just unrolled, are much deteriorated. I quote, one more pregnant passage from the same page of the guide. It describes the removal of the mummies and seems to me to furnish an additional reason for the adoption of the course I have proposed. The museum barge arrived and was laden with its cargo of kings. It was remarkable that between Luxor and Kaft on both sides of the Nile, the Felahine women followed the boat, uttering loud cries and with their hair all disheveled, while the men fired guns as they do at funerals. Fallen as they may be, these poor folk could still mourn over the desecration of the relics of their ancestors' ancient kings. Is it not possible for the representatives of a great Christian power to so arrange that this desecration shall forthwith cease? Perhaps if the English press sees fit to urge the matter. End of Trade in the Dead by H. Ryder Haggard Read by Elsie Selwyn The Traffic in Women by Emma Goldman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Read by Winifred Asman. Our reformers have suddenly made a great discovery, the white slave traffic. The papers are full of these unheard-of conditions, and lawmakers are already planning a new set of laws to check the horror. It is significant that whenever the public mind is to be diverted from a great social wrong, a crusade is inaugurated against indecency, gambling, saloons, etc. And what is the result of such crusades? Gambling is increasing. Saloons are doing a lively business through back entrances. Prostitution is at its height, and the system of pimps and cadets is but aggravated. How is it that an institution, known almost to every child, should have been discovered so suddenly? How is it that this evil, known to all sociologists, should now be made such an important issue? To assume that the recent investigation of the white slave traffic, and, by the way, a very superficial investigation, has discovered anything new, is, to say the least, very foolish. Prostitution has been, and is, a widespread evil. Yet mankind goes on its business, perfectly indifferent to the sufferings and distress of the victims of prostitution. As indifferent, indeed, as mankind has remained to our industrial system or to economic prostitution. Only when human sorrows are turned into a toy with glaring colors will baby people become interested, for a while at least. The people are a very fickle baby that must have new toys every day. The righteous cry against the white slave traffic is such a toy. It serves to amuse the people for a little while and it will help to create a few more fat political jobs, parasites who stalk about the world as inspectors, investigators, detectives, and so forth. What is really the cause of the trade in women? Not merely white women, but yellow and black women as well. Exploitation, of course. The merciless maluk of capitalism that fattens on underpaid labor, thus driving thousands of women and girls into prostitution. With Mrs. Warren, these girls feel, why waste your life working for a few shillings a week in a scullery 18 hours a day? Naturally, our reformers say nothing about this cause. They know it well enough, but it doesn't pay to say anything about it. It is much more profitable to play the Pharisee, to pretend an outraged morality, than to go to the bottom of things. However, there is one commendable exception among the young writers, Reginald Wright Kaufman, whose work, The House of Bondage, is the first earnest attempt to treat the social evil not from a sentimental Philistine viewpoint. A journalist of wide experience, Mr. Kaufman proves that our industrial system leaves most women no alternative except prostitution. The women portrayed in The House of Bondage belong to the working class. Had the author portrayed the life of women in other spheres, he would have been confronted with the same state of affairs. Nowhere is woman treated according to the merit of her work, but rather as a sex. It is therefore almost inevitable that she should pay for her right to exist, to keep a position in whatever line, with sex favors. Thus, it is merely a question of degree whether she sells herself to one man, in or out of marriage, or to many men. Whether our reformers admit it or not, the economic and social inferiority of woman is responsible for prostitution. Just at present, our good people are shocked by the disclosures that in New York City alone, one out of every ten women works in a factory, that the average wage received by women is $6 per week for 48 to 60 hours of work, and that the majority of female wage workers face many months of idleness, which leaves the average wage about $280 a year. In view of these economic horrors, is it to be wondered at that prostitution and the white slave trade have become such dominant factors? Lest the preceding figures be considered an exaggeration, it is well to examine what some authorities on prostitution have to say. Quote, A prolific cause of female depravity can be found in the several tables showing the description of the employment pursued 
and the wages received by the women previous to their fall, and it will be a question for the political economist to decide how far mere business consideration should be an apology on the part of employers for a reduction in their rates of remuneration, and whether the savings of a small percentage on wages is not more than counterbalanced by the enormous amount of taxation enforced on the public at large to defray the expenses incurred on account of a system of vice, which is the direct result, in many cases, of insufficient compensation of honest labor. End quote. Our present-day reformers would do well to look into Dr. Sanger's book. There they will find that out of 2,000 cases under his observation, but few came from the middle classes, from well-ordered conditions or pleasant homes. By far the largest majority were working girls and working women, some driven into prostitution through sheer want, others because of a cruel, wretched life at home, others again because of thwarted and crippled physical natures, of which I shall speak later on. Also, it will do the maintainers of purity and morality good to learn that out of 2,000 cases, 490 were married women, women who lived with their husbands. Evidently, there was not much of a guarantee for their safety and purity in the sanctity of marriage. Dr. Alfred Blaschko, in Prostitution in the 19th Century, is even more emphatic in characterizing economic conditions as one of the most vital factors of prostitution. Quote, Although prostitution has existed in all ages, it was left to the 19th century to develop it into a gigantic social institution. The development of industry with vast masses of people in the competitive market, the growth and congestion of large cities, the insecurity and uncertainty of employment, has given prostitution an impetus never dreamed of at any period in human history. End quote. And again, Havelock Ellis, while not so absolute in dealing with the economic cause, is nevertheless compelled to admit that it is indirectly and directly the main cause. Thus he finds that a large percentage of prostitutes is recruited from the servant class, although the latter have less care and greater security. On the other hand, Mr. Ellis does not deny that the daily routine, the drudgery, the monotony of the servant girl's lot, and especially the fact that she may never partake of the companionship and joy of a home, is no mean factor in forcing her to seek recreation and forgetfulness in the gaiety and glimmer of prostitution. In other words, the servant girl, being treated as a drudge, never having the right to herself, and worn out by the caprices of her mistress, can find an outlet, like the factory or shop girl, only in prostitution. The most amusing side of the question now before the public is the indignation of our good, respectable people, especially the various Christian gentlemen who are always to be found in the front ranks of every crusade. Is it that they are absolutely ignorant of the history of religion, and especially of the Christian religion? Or is it that they hope to blind the present generation to the part played in the past by the church in relation to prostitution? Whatever their reason, they should be the last to cry out against the unfortunate victims of today, since it is known to every intelligent student that prostitution is of religious origin, maintained and fostered for many centuries, not as a shame, but as a virtue, hailed as such by the gods themselves. Quote, it would seem that the origin of prostitution is to be found primarily in a religious custom, religion, the great conserver of social tradition, preserving in a transformed shape a primitive freedom that was passing out of the general social life. The typical example is that recorded by Herodotus in the 5th century before Christ at the Temple of Mylita, the Babylonian Venus, where every woman, once in her life, had to come and give herself to the first stranger who threw a coin in her lap to worship the goddess. Very similar customs existed in other parts of Western Asia, in North Africa, in Cyprus, and other islands of the Eastern Mediterranean, and also in Greece, 
where the temple of Aphrodite on the fort at Corinth possessed over a thousand hierodules dedicated to the service of the goddess. The theory that religious prostitution developed as a general rule out of the belief that the generative activity of human beings possessed a mysterious and sacred influence in promoting the fertility of nature is maintained by all authoritative writers on the subject. Gradually, however, and when prostitution became an organized institution under priestly influence, religious prostitution developed utilitarian sides, thus helping to increase public revenue. The rise of Christianity to political power produced little change in policy. The leading fathers of the church tolerated prostitution. Brothels under municipal protection are found in the 13th century. They constituted a sort of public service, the directors of them being considered almost as public servants. End quote. To this must be added the following from Dr. Sanger's work. Quote, Pope Clement II issued a bull that prostitutes would be tolerated if they pay a certain amount of their earnings to the church. Pope Sixtus IV was more practical. From one single brothel, which he himself had built, he received an income of 20,000 ducats. End quote. In modern times, the church is a little more careful in that direction. At least she does not openly demand tribute from prostitutes. She finds it much more profitable to go in for real estate, like Trinity Church, for instance, to rent out death traps at an exorbitant price to those who live off and buy prostitution. Much as I should like to, my space will not admit speaking of prostitution in Egypt, Greece, Rome, and during the Middle Ages. The conditions in the latter period are particularly interesting, inasmuch as prostitution was organized into guilds, presided over by a brothel queen. These guilds employed strikes as a medium of improving their condition and keeping a standard price. Certainly that is more practical a method than the one used by the modern wage slave in society. It would be one-sided and extremely superficial to maintain that the economic factor is the only cause of prostitution. There are others no less important and vital. That, too, our reformers know, but dare discuss even less than the institution that saps the very life out of both men and women. I refer to the sex question, the very mention of which causes most people moral spasms. It is a conceded fact that woman is being reared as a sex commodity, and yet she is kept in absolute ignorance of the meaning and importance of sex. Everything dealing with the subject is suppressed, and persons who attempt to bring light into this terrible darkness are persecuted and thrown into prison. Yet it is nevertheless true that so long as a girl is not to know how to take care of herself, not to know the function of the most important part of her life, we need not be surprised if she becomes an easy prey to prostitution, or to any other form of a relationship which degrades her to the position of an object for mere sex gratification. It is due to this ignorance that the entire life and nature of the girl is thwarted and crippled. We have long ago taken it as a self-evident fact that the boy may follow the call of the wild, that is to say, that the boy may, as soon as his sex nature asserts itself, satisfy that nature. But our moralists are scandalized at the very thought that the nature of a girl should assert itself. To the moralist, prostitution does not consist so much in the fact that the woman sells her body, but rather that she sells it out of wedlock. That this is no mere statement is proved by the fact that marriage, for monetary considerations, is perfectly legitimate, sanctified by law and public opinion, while any other union is condemned and repudiated. Yet a prostitute, if properly defined, means nothing else than, quote, any person for whom sexual relationships are subordinated to gain. Those women are prostitutes who sell their bodies for the exercise of the sexual act and make of this a profession. End quote. In fact, Banger goes further. He maintains that the act of prostitution is, quote, 
intrinsically equal to that of a man or woman who contracts a marriage for economic reasons. End quote. Of course, marriage is the goal of every girl, but as thousands of girls cannot marry, our stupid social customs condemn them either to a life of celibacy or prostitution. Human nature asserts itself regardless of all laws, nor is there any plausible reason why nature should adapt itself to a perverted conception of morality. Society considers the sex experiences of a man as attributes of his general development, while similar experiences in the life of a woman are looked upon as a terrible calamity, a loss of honor, and of all that is good and noble in a human being. This double standard of morality has played no little part in the creation and perpetuation of prostitution. It involves the keeping of the young in absolute ignorance on sex matters, which alleged innocence, together with an overwrought and stifled sex nature, helps to bring about a state of affairs that our Puritans are so anxious to avoid or prevent. Not that the gratification of sex must needs lead to prostitution. It is the cruel, heartless, criminal persecution of those who dare divert from the beaten paths which is responsible for it. Girls, mere children, work in crowded, overheated rooms 10 to 12 hours daily at a machine which tends to keep them in a constant overexcited sex state. Many of these girls have no home or comforts of any kind. Therefore, the street or some place of cheap amusement is the only means of forgetting their daily routine. This naturally brings them into close proximity with the other sex. It is hard to say which of the two factors brings the girl's oversexed condition to a climax, but it is certainly the most natural thing that a climax should result. That is the first step toward prostitution. Nor is the girl to be held responsible for it. On the contrary, it is altogether the fault of society, the fault of our lack of understanding, of our lack of appreciation of life in the making, especially is it the criminal fault of our moralists, who condemn a girl for all eternity because she has gone from the path of virtue, that is, because her first sex experience has taken place without the sanction of the church. The girl feels herself a complete outcast, with the doors of home and society closed in her face. Her entire training and tradition is such that the girl herself feels depraved and fallen, and therefore has no ground to stand upon, or any hold that will lift her up instead of dragging her down. Thus society creates the victims that it afterwards vainly attempts to get rid of. The meanest, most depraved and decrepit man still considers himself too good to take as his wife the woman whose grace he was quite willing to buy, even though he might thereby save her from a life of horror. Nor can she turn to her own sister for help. In her stupidity, the latter deems herself too pure and chaste, not realizing that her own position is in many respects even more deplorable than her sister's of the street. The wife who married for money, compared with the prostitute, says Havelock Ellis, is the true scab. She is paid less, gives much more in return in labor and care, and is absolutely bound to her master. The prostitute never signs away the right over her own person. She retains her freedom and personal rights, nor is she always compelled to submit to a man's embrace. Nor does the better-than-thou woman realize the apologist claim of Lecky that, quote, though she may be the supreme type of vice, she is also the most efficient guardian of virtue. But for her, happy homes would be polluted, unnatural and harmful practice would abound, End quote. Moralists are ever ready to sacrifice one half of the human race for the sake of some miserable institution which they cannot outgrow. As a matter of fact, prostitution is no more a safeguard for the purity of the home than rigid laws are a safeguard against prostitution. Fully 50% of married men are patrons of brothels. It is through this virtuous element that the married women, nay, even the children, are infected with venereal diseases. Yet society has not a word of condemnation for the man while no law is too monstrous to be set in motion against the helpless victim. 
she is not only preyed upon by those who use her, but she is also absolutely at the mercy of every policeman and miserable detective on the beat, the officials at the station house, the authorities in every prison. In a recent book by a woman who was for twelve years the mistress of a house, are to be found the following figures. Quote, the authorities compelled me to pay every month fines between $14.70 to $29.70. The girls would pay from $5.70 to $9.70 to the police. Considering that the writer did her business in a small city, that the amounts she gives do not include extra bribes and fines, one can readily see the tremendous revenue the police department derives from the blood money of its victims, whom it will not even protect. Woe to those who refuse to pay their toll. They would be rounded up like cattle, if only to make a favorable impression upon the good citizens of the city, or if the powers needed extra money on the side. For the warped mind who believes that a fallen woman is incapable of human emotion, it would be impossible to realize the grief, the disgrace, the tears, the wounded pride that was ours every time we were pulled in. End quote. Strange, isn't it, that a woman who has kept a house should be able to feel that way? But stranger still that a good Christian world should bleed and fleece such women and give them nothing in return except obloquy and persecution. Oh, for the charity of a Christian world! Much stress is laid on white slaves being imported into America. How would America ever retain her virtue if Europe did not help her out? I will not deny that this may be the case in some instances, any more than I will deny that there are emissaries of Germany and other countries luring economic slaves into America. But I absolutely deny that prostitution is recruited to any appreciable extent from Europe. It may be true that the majority of prostitutes in New York City are foreigners, but that is because the majority of the population is foreign. The moment we go to any other American city, to Chicago or the Middle West, we shall find that the number of foreign prostitutes is by far a minority. Equally exaggerated is the belief that the majority of street girls in this city were engaged in this business before they came to America. Most of the girls speak excellent English, are Americanized in habits and appearance, a thing absolutely impossible unless they had lived in this country many years. That is, they were driven into prostitution by American conditions, by the thoroughly American custom for excessive display of finery and clothes, which, of course, necessitates money, money that cannot be earned in shops or factories. In other words, there is no reason to believe that any set of men would go to the risk and expense of getting foreign products when American conditions are over-flooding the market with thousands of girls. On the other hand, there is sufficient evidence to prove that the export of American girls for the purpose of prostitution is by no means a small factor. Thus, Clifford G. Rowe, ex-assistant state attorney of Cook County, Illinois, makes the open charge that New England girls are shipped to Panama for the express use of men in the employ of Uncle Sam. Mr. Rowe adds that, quote, there seems to be an underground railroad between Boston and Washington, which many girls travel, end quote. Is it not significant that the railroad should lead to the very seat of federal authority? That Mr. Rowe said more than was desired in certain quarters is proved by the fact that he lost his position. It is not practical for men in office to tell tales from school. The excuse given for the conditions in Panama is that there are no brothels in the canal zone. That is the usual avenue of escape for a hypocritical world that dares not face the truth. Not in the canal zone, not in the city limits, Therefore, prostitution does not exist. Next to Mr. Rowe, there is James Bronson Reynolds, who has made a thorough study of the white slave traffic in Asia. As a staunch American citizen and friend of the future Napoleon of America, Theodore Roosevelt, he is surely the last to discredit the virtue of his country. Yet we are informed by him that in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Yokohama, 
the Augean stables of American vice are located. There, American prostitutes have made themselves so conspicuous that in the Orient, American girl is synonymous with prostitute. Mr. Reynolds reminds his countrymen that while Americans in China are under the protection of our consular representatives, the Chinese in America have no protection at all. Everyone who knows the brutal and barbarous persecution Chinese and Japanese endure on the Pacific coast will agree with Mr. Reynolds. In view of the above facts, it is rather absurd to point to Europe as the swamp whence came all the social diseases of America. Just as absurd is it to proclaim the myth that the Jews furnish the largest contingent of willing prey. I am sure that no one will accuse me of nationalistic tendencies. I am glad to say that I have developed out of them, as out of many other prejudices. If, therefore, I resent the statement that Jewish prostitutes are imported, it is not because of any Judaistic sympathies, but because of the facts inherent in the lives of these people. No one but the most superficial will claim that Jewish girls migrate to strange lands, unless they have some tie or relation that brings them there. The Jewish girl is not adventurous. Until recent years, she had never left home, not even so far as the next village or town, except it were to visit some relative. Is it then credible that Jewish girls would leave their parents or families, travel thousands of miles to strange lands, through the influence and promises of strange forces? Go to any of the large incoming steamers and see for yourself if these girls do not come either with their parents, brothers, aunts, or other kinsfolk. There may be exceptions, of course, but to state that large numbers of Jewish girls are imported for prostitution or any other purpose is simply not to know Jewish psychology. Those who sit in a glass house do wrong to throw stones about them. Besides, the American glass house is rather thin. It will break easily, and the interior is anything but a gainly sight. To ascribe the increase in prostitution to alleged importation, to the growth of the cadet system or similar causes, is highly superficial. I have already referred to the former. As to the cadet system, abhorrent as it is, we must not ignore the fact that it is essentially a phase of modern prostitution, a phase accentuated by suppression and graft, resulting from sporadic crusades against the social evil. The procurer is no doubt a poor specimen of the human family, but in what manner is he more despicable than the policeman who takes the last cent from the street walker and then locks her up in the station house? Why is the cadet more criminal? or a greater menace to society than the owners of department stores and factories who grow fat on the sweat of their victims only to drive them to the streets. I make no plea for the cadet, but I fail to see why he should be mercilessly hounded while the real perpetrators of all social iniquity enjoy immunity and respect. Then, too, it is well to remember that it is not the cadet who makes the prostitute. It is our sham and hypocrisy that create both the prostitute and the cadet. Until 1894, very little was known in America of the procurer. Then we were attacked by an epidemic of virtue. Vice was to be abolished, the country purified at all cost. The social cancer was therefore driven out of sight, but deeper into the body. Keepers of brothels, as well as their unfortunate victims, were turned over to the tender mercies of the police. The inevitable consequence of exorbitant bribes and the penitentiary followed. While comparatively protected in the brothels, where they represented a certain monetary value, the girls now found themselves on the street, absolutely at the mercy of the graft-greedy police. Desperate, needing protection, and longing for affection, these girls naturally proved an easy prey for cadets, themselves the result of the spirit of our commercial age. Thus the cadet system was the direct outgrowth of police persecution, graft, and attempted suppression of prostitution. It were sheer folly to confound this modern phase of the social evil with the causes of the latter. Mere suppression and barbaric enactments can serve but to embitter 
and further degrade the unfortunate victims of ignorance and stupidity. The latter has reached its highest expression in the proposed law to make humane treatment of prostitutes a crime, punishing anyone sheltering a prostitute with five years' imprisonment and a $10,000 fine. Such an attitude merely exposes the terrible lack of understanding of the true causes of prostitution as a social factor, as well as manifesting the puritanic spirit of the Scarlet Letter days. There is not a single modern writer on the subject who does not refer to the utter futility of legislative methods in coping with the issue. Thus, Dr. Blaschko finds that governmental suppression and moral crusades accomplish nothing save driving the evil into secret channels, multiplying its dangers to society. Havelock Ellis, the most thorough and humane student of prostitution, proves by a wealth of data that the more stringent the methods of persecution, the worse the condition becomes. Among other data, we learn that in France, quote, in 1560, Charles IX abolished brothels through an edict, but the numbers of prostitutes were only increased, while many new brothels appeared in unsuspected shapes, or were more dangerous. In spite of all such legislation, or because of it, there has been no country in which prostitution has played a more conspicuous part. End quote. An educated public opinion, freed from the legal and moral hounding of the prostitute, can alone help to ameliorate present conditions. Willful shutting of eyes and ignoring of the evil as a social factor of modern life can but aggravate matters. We must rise above our foolish notions of better than thou and learn to recognize in the prostitute a product of social conditions. Such a realization will sweep away the attitude of hypocrisy and ensure a greater understanding and more humane treatment. As to a thorough eradication of prostitution, nothing can accomplish that save a complete transvaluation of all accepted values, especially the moral ones, coupled with the abolition of industrial slavery. End of the Traffic in Women by Emma Goldman View of a City Skyline From Popular Magazine, July 1927 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman View of a City Skyline The Variety of Architecture seen in the skyline of an american city is bewildering to one who attempts to classify it and yet charming to the layman because of its very audacity in this country we have taken at random from all the architectural forms in history using each form to suit our own whims and to the rocks with criticism we are not worried by incongruity for we know that there is a real beauty in this careless assorting of types. It is not enough merely to pass off American architecture with a contemptuous shrug, with the observation that we have no native style, and that we must, therefore, ape other lands. Emerson has unwittingly defended, in one of his essays, the seeming inconsistencies seen in metropolitan skylines. Regarding New York City from one of the East River bridges, one sees a vast skyscraper pointing upward, like the magnificent spire of some Gothic cathedral, and, right next to it, a squat office building of some thirty stories, built with ponderous Roman severity. Not far away, one may see a Venetian palace set close to a bank building with a façade of Egyptian columns such as Cleopatra must have passed through many times in her life. Moorish temples, Greek residences, and Turkish domes may rub elbows in the next block. One skyscraper goes up and up, and at the very top there is a house that might have been taken from a Swiss mountainside. 
a chalet. The roof is gabled and painted green. And why not? This is all but part of the sturdy American independence that laughs gaily at traditions. We have an entirely new kind of architecture that shows itself in everything we do, and all these apparent inconsistencies are reconciled in its consideration, the inner architecture of our spirit, a stauncher form than all the others. This is the country of the grin. The end of View of a City Skyline from Popular Magazine, July 1927. Works Progress Administration Art Collection by the U.S. Department of the Treasury. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. During the depression that followed the stock market crash in 1929, thousands of businesses and banks failed, and a quarter of the American workforce was unemployed. An unintended benevolent consequence of the economic hardships of the times was that attendance at many American museums reached an all-time high. Having little money for anything else, the appeal of free museum admissions attracted many Americans, who for the first time were exposed to and appreciated works of art. Through New Deal initiatives under President Franklin D. Roosevelt, beginning in 1933, there was a confluence between the heightened awareness of public art, the employment relief needs of artists, and the creation of artwork for newly constructed federal buildings that resulted in three public arts programs that were administered out of the Treasury Department. Quote, the Treasury Department has erected or is erecting and has control of some 2,800 buildings scattered over the United States and its insular possessions. Under the section of painting and sculpture organized by Secretary of the Treasury Morgenthau on October 16, 1934, approximately 300 of these buildings have been decorated through reservations made under the building fund of each building. With the exception of these buildings, no funds are available, and it is not possible to put murals or sculpture in the remaining ones. Consequently, a request was made to the President by Mr. Edward Bruce of the Treasury Department on April 12, 1935, for funds from the Emergency Relief Appropriation Act of 1935 to 1937 for a project to employ competent, unemployed artists in decorating federal buildings where there was no money available for this decoration under the building fund. This broadens the scope of the Treasury Department's art program and enables the government to obtain first-rate works of art for many of its buildings at the, quote, going, end quote, WPA wage rate, as specified in Executive Order Number 7046. The results of this work will be a permanent and important addition to the wealth of this country, a wealth which will increase in value as time goes on and as its worth is more justly appreciated, end quote, Interim Report, Treasury Relief Art Project, May 1, 1936. Much of the momentum to create and manage the arts program at the Treasury Department were provided by artist George Biddle and Treasury Administrator Edward Bruce. Biddle was a practicing artist who had traveled and lived in Europe and had worked with some of the best mural painters in Mexico. On May 9, 1933,
he wrote a letter to newly elected president roosevelt f d r suggesting the government create opportunities in federal buildings for american mural painters to quote, improve the quality of american life end quote. two weeks later f d r had arranged for biddle to meet with treasury assistant secretary lawrence robert jr who oversaw the federal building construction program through the supervising architect's office when biddle and robert met in june biddle learned that congress had approved funds for the decoration of the new department of justice and post office buildings in washington d c but they were reluctant to spend the funds on a quote, luxury end quote, like art shortly after the meeting biddle wrote a letter to various government officials including first lady eleanor roosevelt proposing a quote, revival of mural painting end quote, in america mrs roosevelt passed the letter along to f d r who approved of the concept treasury assistant secretary robert was also impressed with the plan as was the justice department building architect charles borey within the treasury department the greatest advocate of biddle's proposal was edward bruce an expert on monetary policy who had joined treasury in nineteen thirty two and was a good friend of assistant secretary robert in addition to his financial pedigree bruce was an amateur artist and enthusiastic arts advocate in october of nineteen thirty three bruce held a series of gatherings at his washington home to discuss ideas for how the government could support a national arts program while assistant secretary robert and the treasury department supported the idea of an arts program there was not a mechanism within the department to provide a funding source to secure funding, Bruce and Biddle met with Public Works Administrator Harold Ikes. At the meeting, Ikes supported the program and agreed that it could be funded through the Relief Administration administered by Harry Hopkins. Hopkins saw no distinction in being able to provide a relief opportunity for artists than it would be for plumbers or any other profession and allocated one million thirty nine thousand dollars to the arts program the collection at the treasury building includes sixty two works of art from the new deal wpa arts programs that operated over a ten-year period from nineteen thirty three to nineteen forty three the works progress administration federal art project was the largest and the most widely known program there is less awareness of the three wpa programs that operated directly out of the treasury department the public works of art project the section on painting and sculpture and the treasury relief act the contributions of these programs remain highly visible to this day in many of the country's federal buildings the connection between the New Deal artwork and the Treasury continues through the stewardship and display of WPA artwork in the Treasury building. Quote, Art in America has always belonged to the people and has never been the property of an academy or a class. The great Treasury projects through which our public buildings are being decorated are an excellent example of the continuity of this tradition the federal art project of the works progress administration wpa is a practical relief project which also emphasizes the best tradition of the democratic spirit the wpa artist in rendering his own impression of things speaks also for the spirit of his fellow countrymen everywhere i think the w p a artist exemplifies with great force the essential place the arts have in a democratic society such as ours end quote. president franklin d roosevelt may tenth nineteen thirty nine summary of the four new deal arts programs 
public works of art project section on painting and sculpture treasury relief act works progress administration federal art project the first federal art program the public works of art project pwap was a crash relief program administered without a strict relief test by the treasury department the program lasted six months from december 1933 to june 1934 employing three thousand seven hundred artists at a cost of approximately one million three hundred twelve thousand dollars the section of painting and sculpture program later called the section of fine arts was created by treasury secretary henry morgenthau jr and was the second federal arts program administered by the treasury department it obtained paintings and sculptures through competitions to decorate new federal buildings largely post offices and courthouses inaugurated in october 1934 the program ended in 1943 after awarding approximately 1400 contracts for art at a cost of two million five hundred seventy one thousand dollars the treasury relief act was formed on july 21 1935 by an initial allocation of five hundred thirty thousand seven hundred eighty four dollars from the wpa to the treasury for the decoration of federal buildings administered under the same relief rules as the wpa the section administering the act employed 446 people including 275 artists 75 percent of whom were on relief wpa employment rates ranged from 69 dollars to 103 dollars per month the cost of the program was eight hundred thirty three thousand seven hundred eighty four dollars and was operated up until 1939 the work progress administration's federal art project wpa slash fap was part of a wider government program called federal project number no. one which included the visual arts as well as drama music and writing it was started in 1935 and was administered according to the relief rules of the wpa the program employed over 5,000 people and cost 35 million dollars lasting until june of 1943 end of works progress administration art collection by the u s department of the treasury read for librivox by sue anderson